Mark Bell, toll free. West of the Rockies at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies at 1-800-825-5033. 1-800-825-5033. This is the CBC Radio Network. Exactly what it is. Good morning, everybody. I'm Art Bell. We're just going to be here rocking through the night, about 1 a.m. Pacific, an hour from now. Dr. Dr. Edgar, Edgar Mitchell will get it out. Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell will be here. That should be interesting. Otherwise, we're talking of the news, and it's not good news. Things in this country surely are changing. That six-year-old may be charged with attempted murder, premeditated murder. There are now signs that this child actually premeditated trying to beat this baby to death. Nobody knows what to do about it. It really is a problem. Um, crimes of this sort on the increase, 300% the last decade, you want to shake your head? Go ahead. It's all I've been able to do with it. What do you do with a six-year-old child who... Well, actually, um, it's said now that this child thought that he had to kill the infant, the 30-day-old infant, because his family was being harassed. His, the six-year-old family's uh, family was being harassed in Georgia. There have been uh, there's been the arrest of two men. They say militia connected, or claim to be in the militia. One of the men, commander of a militia, who was making bombs, pipe bombs, and burying them against the day when they'd have to be used uh, against the government. It's a strange world. May you live in interesting times. The curse went with more. Art, did you go to Shepard Air Force Base after Lackland? If so, what squadron were you in and what was your FSC? No, not Shepard. I went to uh, Amarillo after tech school. And then he asks, where was I when uh, President Kennedy was assassinated? Uh, everybody remembers that, of course, and I was in the hospital uh, as a worker at uh, Lackland at the moment of the assassination. And, of course... Uh, I'll never forget that. I was, uh, for your edification, my FSC was a 90250. I was a medic in the Air Force. All right, um, back to the lines, east of the Rockies. You're on the air. Good morning. Yeah, all right. This is uh, Tim from uh, Indiana. Yes, sir. Yeah, I had a question for the astronaut. All right. Um, in regards to, like, uh, oh, now I'm having a problem remembering. Here, I'll get it. Um, when they were having to uh, maneuver the uh, the spaceship to go to the moon, yes, were there any times in which they were uh, flying there that they had uh, problems with uh, you know their guidance or, or anything like that? Because after watching the Apollo 13, um, I kind of wondered how he felt, you know, going to the moon right after <laughs> that happening. Yes, that's a very good question, and you can be sure I'll ask it. Uh, you can be sure I'll ask it, sure. The mission after 13 must have been something of a terror. How could they know there would not be a repeat? Uh, the 13 astronauts missing it by that much. Escaping by that much. How could they not be very concerned that there would be a repeat? I'm sure they were. And that is a good question. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Good evening. Well, good evening, actually. Yes, actually. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm calling from KSIRO, Santa, or Santa Rosa. I actually live in Rona Park, California. Yes, ma'am. About 50 miles north of the bay. I, I'm calling because I've pretty well followed the, uh, the tragedy of the six-year-old for some time. And, you know, there's one thing that is a question that I have never been answered. Maybe somebody knows that where were the parents and, or the caretakers of these children when this happened? It, it seems strange that a one-month-old child would not would be left unattended, and no one heard it cry, no one heard it fall, no one heard of the assault on its little body. Uh, I find that 
Well, you said you've been. You, you said you said you've been following this very closely, so you should have those answers for us. I, I don't I've know. never read a thing about that. Never heard a thing about that. That makes two of us. You oh, that's true of you too. Yeah. The, and any of these children, actually the six-year-old or the eight-year-old, apparently you a, are had you, no caretaker. Uh, are you a parent? I'm a parent and a grandparent both. Okay. Well, then, you remember, I, I too, uh, was a parent. There are times, I guess, when you're in another room, another part of the house. I mean... Would, would that it, baby not cry? Would that baby not do... Would they not hear it thump on the floor? Would they not hear these maybe they talking? covered. Maybe they covered its mouth. I mean, from what I've heard, they intended. And these other little boys. Excuse me. Uh, for, excuse me. From what I heard, they intended uh, to kill it. Right. That's that's what they're charging the six-year-old uh -huh. with. So if you're going to do that, you might cover up its little mouth, mightn't you? Sure. Sure. And and regarding Dr. Mitchell. Yes. I I'm wondering if uh, there was no cost involved. Would he recommend the rest of us take a vacation on the move? What about the stress getting there and getting back? Would that be a, a trip to take? Uh, would it be worth it? Would you? I don't think so. I don't oh, know if, if being on the moon would be worth the trip going and coming. Oh, yes, it would. Would it? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, great. Oh, I'm bet. glad you lost it. Oh, oh absolutely. I'd go in a second. Card. I'd go in a second. Uh, thank you very much. Sure, I'd go in a second. You know, but that's me. Oh, you bet. Would it be worth it? A few days uh, cooped up in a in a spaceship? With no gravity? Would it be worth it? Oh, hell yes. <laughs> I would do it in a second. I'd do it in a second. Especially at my age. Uh, maybe a young person would think harder about it. I don't know. I can't imagine it. There are, though, a lot of people who wouldn't even think about it. I, I, I would just, I wouldn't hesitate for a second. People risk their lives, um, given the odds with the record they had for much less. And um, even though we're going to get Dr. Mitchell's words this morning about what it was like on the moon, I guess there are no words that would do justice to actually being there, are there? First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, Art. Yes. Dale from Tacoma. Yes, sir. Ed Mitchell and uh, Alan Shepard, when they were descending, their landing radar was out. And I was always curious if they were going to land without it. If you could ask them that, I'd appreciate it. Um, you're saying when they were uh, headed down to the moon, their landing radar was out? It was non-functional. It turned out to be it was just locked up. They got it working again before their, uh, before their limit. But uh, it was out when they were going down, and uh, there was a point in time when they were not supposed to land if it didn't come on. And, of course, it came on, but I was just curious if, they, uh, if he had any insight on that. Would you, uh, had you been on that mission, I mean, to get that far, to be in the LEM, and then to have the landing radar fail, uh, if, uh, I mean, you're halfway down, or whatever, would you keep going? Would you say, sorry, Houston, missed that transmission? <laughs> Me? Well, yeah, or would I you, probably would have. Would you abort the mission? You'd keep going, huh? Well, he was in charge. Of course, Alan was the man landing it, and it was yes. his final say. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it was up to me, I probably would have, because uh, you went that far, I mean, crash, who cares? Sorry, Houston. Yeah, right. I didn't catch that last Transmission one. Transmission was jarbled. But, uh, I, I, I was really into it as a child and, and have all the tapes on that. And, in fact, I got that from Moonshot, uh, the documentary by um, uh, Slayton. Yes. And I was just curious. If you could ask him that, I thought it would be kind of interesting. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Uh, I'll try to get all these. Now, obviously, I'm beginning to compile quite a list of questions here. So I'll, I'll do what I can, and I have no idea uh, for how long we have him. So... Um, We'll try and get as much of this in as, as we're able. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Hello, this is Janine from Bellingham. Hi, Janine. Hi, I've got some insights about this six-year-old. All right. Um, yeah, I was um, flipping through the channels on my day off and looking at some of the, the morning time uh, cartoons that are on. And yes. it always seems to be the good guys and the bad guys and the one that comes and saves the day. And, and yes. I was just really appalled at... You know, it's okay to, you know, to to kill. You know, there's all. I don't, Janine. I don't think it was TV. How old are you? Huh? 
Me? I'm 33. 33, all right. When I was a child, I watched all of those tunes. I watched, especially the Roadrunner. You know where in one scene the Roadrunner is, um, uh, actually Wile E. Coyote is absolutely destroyed or gets smushed or something, and he's back up and bouncing around in the next scene. I watched all of that, and that didn't uh, lead me in any sort of direction of assuming that violence was all right. I never for a second believed that. Yeah. Well, I have a six-year-old and a, and a nine-year-old kids, and both of them are extremely compassionate, you know, loving children, and um, it wouldn't affect them, but I think a child that wasn't uh, really brought up in a super loving home, with bonded with the mother at birth, and, mm -hmm. and really loved, might, might become kind of disconnected from society and just, just kind of buy into that violent thing. I don't know, it's hard to understand, but um, when I saw these these children's cartoons that are on, I just it just kind of struck yeah. me that maybe that was part of the problem. I, I appreciate the call, and we'll think about that, of course. And I did think about that, and I've seen the uh, experts endlessly uh, talking on CNN and elsewhere, you know, about this thing. They talk about television and about cartoon characters, but hell. I watched all that stuff, and I bet a lot of you did, too. And I, I don't for a second believe that that is the factor that could precipitate a 300% change in these kinds of uh, crimes in a decade. I don't believe that for a second. There's something else at work here. Cartoons were always that way. Remember Tweety Bird? I mean, we could go on and on and on and on with cartoons where there was violence in one second, a curse smash, a kaboom, a fall off a cliff. Oh, let me document the ways. And then in the next scene, they're back up, unsmushed, and back at it. And the charge is, well, children see this kind of thing, and they assume that they're not really doing any harm. Bull. I'm sorry to say I believe that child, I believe, my belief, knew what it was doing. The signs are that it did. And now the more that I think back on it, at even six, I, I would have, I knew. Didn't you? And you understand death and dying, even at six? Sure, you did. Wildcard Line, you're on the air. Good morning. Yes, Mr. Bell. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Hey, I was trying to get, uh, get through last night to, to speak to Mr. Hoagland. Would you turn your radio off for us, please? Yes, yeah, sure did. That's good. Um, question for you. Now, I've heard references to uh, Zachariah Sitchin, and uh, he was actually the first time I'd ever read of the Sidonia region and the pyramids and, and other things. Uh, structures that are on Mars. I was wondering if uh, you knew anything about, uh, say, corresponding uh, theories that Mr. Sitchin might have uh, along with Mr. Ho Hoagland? Well, yes. Uh, you'd want to read a book called The Twelfth Planet, sir, by Zachariah Sitchin. The Twelfth Planet. And a full a series of books. We'll have Zachariah Sitchin uh, back on again. He is a very, very interesting guest. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Mr. Bell. Mr. Caller. <laughs> My name is Phil. I'm calling from KCMO country. Hi, Phil. Mike Murphy country, we call it. You bet. <laughs> Listen, um, may change the subject just a little bit, but uh, I'm wondering on this Gordon Michael Scallion uh, situation, his predictions. I haven't heard much out of him lately. Uh, well, he hasn't been on the air. I, I got a fax uh, from Gordon, uh, Gordon's people the other day, and he's on a break. He has long periods of time where after um, taking or having visions, he is not well. Oh, really? Uh, not, not truly sick, but um, very exhausted. Wow. And so he's on a break right now. Okay. He uh, did predict, uh, made, made a prediction on... Uh, paranormal borderline regarding Phobos and uh, his assistant Harold uh, said I'd prefer not to comment until we get an actual script of what Gordon Michael said on paranormal borderline uh, so, uh, so otherwise we'll be commenting in the blind so that's where we are with that um, if, if one more thing if you don't mind um, on his uh, set of earthquakes that he predicted, it's three sets of four. Yes. Four sets of three. Three sets of four. Three sets of four. Uh, what? What? Where are we at on that? Not complete. No, I didn't think so. I didn't think so. Every time I. You'd hear know, it, there'd be a big news bulletin, you know, 
CNN breaking news, and there'd be a shot of where California used to be. <laughs> We're sir. in the third set. You'll know, sir. Okay. Thank you very much for the call. If it completes, trust me, you'll know. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Yeah, this is Steve in Portland. Hi, Steve. And uh, my question for Edgar would be about uh, what happens in the debriefing process after they come back. You mean, you mean where they tell you what you can say and what you can't? Yeah, exactly. I mean, because it was always <laughs> mysterious. You know, they'd pick them up out of the ocean, and then they'd be gone for a while. <laughs> Uh, well, yes. It, I, I believe in the beginning they were doing quite a isolation period uh, after after they came back. And then uh, the other thing would be, uh, was he anticipating finding any like great discovery on the moon? You know, as as he was going there, and then could he have told us about it if he had? All right. Uh, those are all fair questions. Thank you. I'll consider those. Or maybe more to the point, what did you see that you haven't told anybody about? <laughs> you know what kind of answer you're going to get to that question, though, don't you? Actually, I guess I can't say that. I, I have no idea what kind of uh, answer we're going to get to these questions, so I will not presume. With a little bit of luck, uh, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, uh, Apollo 14's Edgar Mitchell, coming up. Uh, in about 37 minutes or so. You hear this music on my show just about every night. Sometimes several times in one night. It's the awesome music of my favorite group, Cusco. Well, now listen, they've got a special offer only for my listeners. If you like to Permac, you're going to love these. You get the Cusco 2000 album, plus Cusco 2002 and the best-selling album, Mystic Island, all three CDs for the discount price of $39.95 or $27.95 for cassettes and listen. That includes postage. But I'm not done. Add $5 more, and Higher Octave will include two more CDs, Sampler CDs full of music of the same genre. In other words, five CDs for less than the cost of three. Call Higher Octave at 1-800-562-8283. Mention my name, Art Bell. Save up to 29% off the regular prices. Again, that number, 1-800-562-8283. Higher Octave and Cusco. All right, uh, just a little promo here. We did a full five hours with Richard Hoagland last night. It was an amazing five hours, actually. And if you would like a copy of that program with Richard Hoagland, or you would like to order our newsletter, and let me tell you right now, uh, we have got an issue coming up, the cutoff date of which is Sunday night right after uh, Dreamland. It has got some of the most definitively beautiful crop circle uh, photographs in it that you're ever going to see in your life. The next issue is going to have Arts Parts or the Roswell stuff. Uh, those photos in it. But this one you don't want to miss. Uh, so whether you want to order our newsletter, get a copy of the show last night, whatever, here is the number. It's 1-800-917-4278. That's one 800 Nine one seven four two seven eight. Didn't hear the whole thing. Also, coming this week on Dreamland, Robert Ghost Wolf this Sunday, a Lakota Iroquois shaman on Native American prophecy, and so that should be most interesting. If you don't have uh, Dreamland as of yet, contact your radio station, whoever that is, and ask politely that they try to find room to carry it. And they can do that by carrying it live or offsetting uh, the hours. They can do it any way they like. Let's see, there's something else I'm supposed to do here, too. Ah, Mother's Day cometh. You know, it's, what, a week away? A little better than a week away? Something like that. What is today? No, it's two weeks away. It's almost the middle of the month, 13th, 14th, something like that Sunday, I think. It would be a good time now to order absolutely fresh flowers for your mom. Because there is a chance you will not catch my programs coming up toward Mother's Day. 
and you can, can in fact order right now. Just get it out of the way, get it done, and you can actually then forget it because it'll be done. You can be sure that FedEx will be there just before Mother's Day. Flowers in hand, this giant triangular box full of miniature carnations, you can be sure they'll be there. But if you blow it off and you forget it, well, you may not hear the program again, catch the number, and then it'll be too late for you. So, look, write the number down I'm going to give you. These are miniature carnations, more than anybody's ever seen, with a card from you, your message, your name, happy birthdays, uh, Mother's Day, Mom, uh, your name at the bottom, sign at the bottom, all handwritten. That's quite a bit for $42.95. Plan ahead, do it now. 1-800-562-6438. That's one 800 Five six two six four three eight. Absolutely fresh flowers. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, you are. Charles from St. Louis. Hi, Charles. Yes. How are you doing? Fine. Uh, just one little question. Well, the guy, he took my question about the deep, the, the deep grieving period uh, and the period of isolation. You know, how long would he be uh, in the deep, deep grieving period? Right. But one other little question was about the gravity. Um I would like to know how, how how did the gravity feel? Could he jump as high as he could on Earth? Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. I, I, that that my question went the same way. In other words, I want to know if the whole thing was fun, and that to me, getting up in zero or near zero gravity, particularly near zero gravity, that would be fun. Yeah, jumping around. <laughs> yeah, sort of like Superman. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that's just basically all. You know what I want to know, too? What's that? We went to the moon, went to the moon, went to the moon. Now we haven't gone to the moon yeah, in yeah. 30 years. How come? That, yeah, that sent me. <laughs> I'd love to hear the answer to that one. Thank you very much. 30 years. We did it. We did it again and again and again. Then we just flat stopped. How come? There ought to be a good answer for that one, shouldn't there? We'll be right back. on the wild card line at 702-727-1295. That's 702-727-1295. First time callers can reach Art Bell at 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222. Now, here again, Art Bell. Once again, I am indeed here at the top of the hour. If all goes well, and I say if all goes well because one never knows, Dr. Edgar Mitchell is due to be here, the Apollo 14 astronaut. Guy who walked on the moon. And here's a good question from somebody out there. Art, I can imagine the gambit of emotions that one would experience as you look from the moon to your world, the one on which you experienced your childhood and life experience. Art, please ask Dr. Mitchell what was his first emotion and question at the moment he realized out there your vision of the moon and universe from the eyes of his youth was now at his feet. Did he ever experience sadness for the people on Earth, and if so, why? Sadness for the people on Earth. I wouldn't think that would be the emotion, but uh, we will surely ask him. West of the Rockies, you are on the air, top of the morning. Oh, good morning, Art. Uh, good morning. Um, I lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. Well, you never got it, sir. Uh, <laughs> actually, I want to comment on that uh, guy that called uh, about a week ago. Um, I thought that was the most hilarious thing I've ever heard in my life. Which guy are you talking about? Um, the one that was calling you a demon. Oh, yeah. That, that, we, that, that was such a good call that um, we've taken it and put it up on the Internet on my web page. You can actually download that call and listen to it. Oh, you're kidding me. The guy who thought I was a devil's toe jam, right? <laughs> 
I, I was laughing so hard I was rolling on the floor. <laughs> uh, I know it's a good call. No, it was a good call. And uh, also, I'm not sure if the American people are ready um, either to find out about UFOs or. No, I'm not. I'm not sure either. I, I've said this, and people take me to task for it. But I think the Brookings report is probably accurate. And that really puts me in a stinking position with the materials that I've got and the report I'm going to be getting. Uh, assuming that it would come back uh, anything but uh, normal materials, you know, I'd have to sit down and think about it. Exactly. And also, about that six-year-old boy, Yes. what the heck do you do? I mean, it is a very sad thing that the 30-day-old baby is probably going to die, and I'm really sorry for that. I know. Uh, I, I appreciate the call. The father and mother of the um, baby, who had three other children, get this, folks. According to the Associated Press, were out shopping, grocery shopping at the time of the beating. They had not taken the young Ignacio along because he had a cough. They worried the chilly evening air would make it worse. So the parents of this little baby weren't home. They left at home alone. Who the hell would leave a 30-day-year-old uh, uh, child at home alone? Uh, there's, there's one good point. Now, so the parents of the uh, infant were, were not even home at the time, and they don't say anybody was left there with the infant. So... That's crazy. That's crazy. Never left my son alone for a second. Uh, well, alone maybe in a room. That's what I speculated about earlier, but not alone in the house. Of course not. There could be a fire. Anything could happen. Uh, so that's an amazing bit of news. And then, west of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Um, yes. I'd like to ask you two questions for tonight. Um, now, what was this um, thing about this guy calling you a demon? Oh, you had to hear the call. Um, can you sh uh, tell me about, about it, basically, about what the basic of the conversation was? You already covered it. He just called you a demon and hung up? No. He, w he, he kept calling me a demon for at least three minutes. The devil's mouthpiece. The what devil's he, toe jam. What did he say before that to make, to make you... The man of the burning pits of hell. Okay. And uh, the six-year-old boy, do you think he should get the chair? The rock, uh, what would that be, the uh, high chair? No, electric chair. Oh, I see. Well, um, they gonna, did that 30 year old, um, the 30 um, month old uh, or whatever, um, die? Or is he, what's going on with that uh, baby? 30 day old baby, sir. Uh, the baby is in critical condition on life support. Has been that way for now into the sixth day. So that you might know. And, of course, when they're in critical condition, it's unknown whether they're going to make it or not. Okay, wild card line, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning, Art. Dave calling from KEX country. Hi, Dave. Uh, it might understand, Art, that you don't feel that cartoons or TV in general have any effect on children? No, I didn't say that. Okay, you said cartoons don't, though. N no, I didn't say that. Oh, okay. uh, what I said was, uh, I watched cartoons all my young life. How old are you, Dave? I'm um, 38. 38. Did you watch cartoons when you were a kid? I sure did. How many murders have you committed? Uh, you mean counting uh, this month? Ah, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. None. All right. Well, uh, so, so the cartoons, you know, Roadrunner and otherwise, didn't affect me. I knew they were cartoons. I understood the difference between cartoons in real life. Okay. I never murdered, well, I did put a big shovel mark in the middle of my sister's nose, but I, I never murdered anybody, and uh, uh, you didn't, and I don't think the average person did. So I think it's, it's controversial. I do think television has some effect, but I don't think it's turned our youngsters in the last decade into murderers. Well, the reason I bring that up is because I, I lived with a woman who had a child who used to watch the He-Man cartoon. Are you familiar with that? Of course. But one day I caught uh, the sick. He was sick at the time, and he uh, took his little brother's head and, and stepped on it. It's like, it's like just like the cartoon. Now I'm not saying he's going to turn into a murderer or, or, or anything like that, but I do feel with the psychological studies that where they show the adult modeling against one of those dolls that you hit, and, and it 
comes right back up. You remember what I'm talking about? Do you honestly think that cartoons are showing any less death, dying, or smushing in the last decade than they did in decades previous? Well, I don't remember the He-Man type of thing. Those those He-Man or those Wonder, whatever they are, that show actually more humans. I mean, seeing the Roadrunner and, and the Wiley Coyote, I think, I'm not saying that was any less, but I'm just saying that now they show more of you know, like what looks like Mommy and Daddy on the actual mm -hmm. TV screen that are beating up on... on uh, cartoon characters. That's, that's all I'm trying to say. Okay. Uh, well, I appreciate it. Thank you. I don't rule it out. I've always thought that television does have some effect. And I've always thought that there ought to be some sort of, uh, you know, you hate the word censorship, but uh, some restraint shown in the period of time uh, during which children get home from school, a lot of them latchkey, and the later evening programming. You know, there's kind of a window in there where they come home, open the door, shut it, grab a Coke, sit down in front of the television, and there you, away you go. So I don't think it's the uh, main and or only factor, but it probably it probably has an effect. I think it has an effect. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Whoops, would have been. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning, Art. Yes, sir. Uh, this is CJ from Lathrop, California. Hi, CJ. Uh, i got a couple things for you. Uh, one's a what if, and the other one is, uh, having worked for the dark side of our government in past years... Uh, you did? Yes, I did. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the oath of silence is something taken very seriously by people who work for the dark side of the government. Uh, and though you might not say that the... Uh, uh, astronauts worked for the dark side. They truly did. They worked for the DOD. Would that be the? Uh, would that apply to people who went to the dark side of the moon? <laughs> no, I, I just call the dark side of the, the government uh, anything to do with the national security, and I termed it the dark side because there is truly a dark side to our government. And there is to every government. Well, there is a dark side to stealth work. Yes. Uh, but it is in the cause of national security. That doesn't make it always dark. Um, oh, I understand or, that. Or at least they, people should understand the context of dark. National security is by nature stealth, and I guess you could say that's dark, but it's not always bad. Well, many dark things happen. I've been working for nearly 15 years for the dark side of our government. I've found plenty of dark things. Yeah, but, dark. Uh, you know, so I understand that oath of silence thing, and I think that they're just kind of dribbling this out like you've speculated and uh, others have speculated, and this might be a way for them to get about doing it. Uh, well, I don't expect Dr. Mitchell to come on this morning and say, you know, Richard Hoagland's right. We didn't tell you about the 20-mile-high structures. You know, we just sort of left it out at the time, and I don't expect to hear that. Oh, right. I, I understand that. Uh, and and that, that comes along with my what if. Uh, I want people to imagine this. Now, tomorrow, a UFO, a nice large one, lands at the U.N., and they walk inside and they talk for two hours, and the whole time the, all the world got TV cameras, you know, CNN and everybody else has got their TV cameras there. <clears throat> what do you imagine the percentage of people that would just go absolutely bonkers and think their life is mm -hmm. over and, you know, the world would just be in a total uproar? Yes. So I think, you know, you're right when you say you don't think that they're ready. The Brookings report is probably right. Sure it is. People would just literally freak. I mean, total anarchy would just take over in a matter of hours. You know? Well, I hate to believe that, but I, I'm afraid I do. I think enough people just literally lose it because of it. I mean, there'd be people jumping out of windows for starters, and, and you know, another percentage of people would be running out and robbing banks and headed for the hills. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, uh, I want everybody to think about that. Uh, what if that happened tomorrow? What do they think would happen? You know, all the people that they know, how many of the people that they know could handle this rationally and some who wouldn't? handle this rationally. There's enough crazy people already. Well, it, this it, happen. Yeah, it would be a mixture, and uh, absolutely true that a lot of people would not handle it well. And it would not take a lot of people not to handle it well to cause a big problem. Uh, so uh, there you are, and I, I just think that is a fact, and it leaves me in a very tough spot with regard to the materials that I have. No question about that. Uh, Art, May 7th, uh, paranormal borderline. Is that uh, 9 p.m. Eastern or Western? I think it's 9. 
I think it's 9 o'clock uh, here in the West. I'm pretty sure it's 9 o'clock, but I'm not positive. So check your TV guide, all right? Uh, Richard Hoagland was supposedly to team up with Sarah McLendon. What happened? Well, they did get together is what happened, and Sarah McLendon wrote an article about it. You should put your hands on that, sir. All right, um, back to the lines. First time caller line. You're on the air. Hello. Yes. Yes. Um, um. I, ha I have something to report that I have an 8 millimeter movie film that is in color. Of? It was taken in 1967. Yes. And well, it's a view out of an airplane cockpit window. Looking... Would you would you turn down your radio, please? Okay. Thank you. Uh, a view, an eight millimeter film, a view outside a uh, airplane cockpit window. Or... Yes. Uh huh. And in the film, I put it under a microscope, and I can make out an absolute elliptical shaped object that is glowing with a very bright white light because the light is reflecting into the cockpit window. I have 12 years of experience working in technical areas, and I work now as, uh, I guess I'm repairing computer robotics boards. You guess? Well, well, I, that's one of the things that I work on, among many other electronic-type things. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I have this film, and I'm kind of like worried about how to get it analyzed and like some kind of a professional team to look at this. I acquired the film. I did not take the film. How did you acquire it? Uh, through a friend of a friend. A friend of a friend. Uh, an older lady friend of mine. Uh, she acquired the, the film from uh, some friends of hers who are older gentlemen. And they turned it over to her because they wanted me to make a videotape of the film for them so they could put it on their VCR. Yeah, I was going to suggest that. Uh, get the film converted to video. Uh, then you'll be able to um, supply copies, and you can get several first-generation copies made and uh, get one of those analyzed without risking your original film. That's what I guess I would do. And uh, most... Uh, photographic stores can accomplish that for you. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Hello, yes. Um, are you not speaking with a uh, person at this time? Or are, are you a person? Oh, yeah. I, I I'm, speaking, a, I'm speaking uh, with you, and there is a delay. Turn your radio off, and you won't worry about it. Oh, well, I thought the, uh, you still had the uh, lady caller on there. Well, I have a delay, sir. Oh, so okay. Turn your radio well. off. Okay, fine. Yeah, a couple quick comments here. The the matter you mentioned about the telephone, or, well, the ringing, uh, uh, the ringing only for so long is that I called the phone company about that, and they claim that was the uh, that that was a policy of the one eight hundred uh, the the, uh, the radio station. You know, that, that was your or well, y'all was doing so to speak. No, is it? that is inaccurate. Well, okay, good. I'm totally, glad. absolutely, it's utterly it's inaccurate. We have been as high in the phone company as you can get, trying uh -huh. to get it changed. And, yeah, because, uh, see, that happened to me two, uh, two times just tonight. It happens to everybody, sir. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit... Uh, Annoying. And like I said, I called and I, and I talked, and she, she was vehement about it. This Well, this she is it. wrong. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> also, that the... Uh, oh, yeah, the, the uh, Unsolved Mysteries had the Chubacabra goat sucker thing on again there tonight that's right what do you what do you think well actually I, I'm, I'm not uh i wouldn't be surprised i you know with the with well all the footage i've seen i'm going on 40 years old here and I, with all the footage i've seen and this and that with the uh, uh with the yeti the, the sasquatch that i, I have the, the plesiosaur uh, theory of the uh, loch ness the, the giant squids etc I, I have no problem with that that's uh, that we're we got uh, things far beyond to be concerned about that. But the new movie coming out, matter of fact, you mentioned someone had asked you a while back your favorite science fiction movies. I'm sure you've seen The Day There's Just Still, 1951. Uh, Long ago. Yes. Uh, Michael that, Rennie, wasn't it? Yes, indeed. Excellent actor. I uh, wish I could have met that fellow. Uh, now, the new movie coming up is Independence Day. Yes. Um, any sort of... Uh, 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 first-hand information, any, anything that the, the uh, general public doesn't have any knowledge of. Does everything you're going to see in Independence Day, sir, mm -hmm. is absolutely true. Oh, let's see. 
Well, okay, it, yeah, matter of fact, a couple of questions there for the uh, uh, Dr. Mitchell there. If he comes yes, on let's, here. let's try that. Uh, is it um, the, uh, the, well, the Nazca Plain in Peru, that seems rather obvious. The what? The Nazca Plain in Peru with all the, the lines and the... Oh, yes, the, yes, the, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, now T Tunguska, uh, matter of fact, I uh, didn't get a chance to ask uh, Mr. Hoagland last night. It's just so much stuff. Golly, it's just... Um, in Siberia. The explosion. Supposedly it yeah. was a uh, Tesla experiment that was off by a couple of degrees, so to speak. Or Well, that, all right, thank you. That's all very controversial. Was it something from elsewhere that slammed in? Was it um, a Tesla experiment gone wild? Nobody knows. Microtech. Now, I just know that I don't have to tell you what's happening to telecommunications. It's going nuts. It's not just a technical revolution, but it's an explosion of opportunity, business opportunity. Microtech is one of the premier companies that's had the strength and foresight to grab a big piece of the hot new SMR market, specialized mobile radio. Remember SMR because you're going to be hearing a lot about it. When it comes to Microtech, the future is now. They've already completed SMR stations in major markets like New York, L.A., Dallas, Boston, They've got more to build while license opportunities last, and that is where you may come in if you qualify as an investor and you're willing to make one free phone call. You can discover how a minimum $8,700 uh, put now in the explosive telecommunications industry could return to you twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 or more, plus a yearly income for the rest of your life. And yes, it can be part of your IRA or retirement plan. So call them. Their number is 1-800-444-1049. You'll get free information. That's 1-800-444-1049. I'd be willing to bet that you assume, if you eat good food, that you're getting nutrition and you'll be healthy, right? Well, under most circumstances, yes, that would be true. But you must understand that lining the wall of your digestive tract is a bacteria. Not a bad bacteria but a good bacteria, one you need, because it is the engine that drives the nutrition into your body and the wastes out. Now, what can happen to that bacteria? Lots of bad things. Antibiotics kill it, bad diet, alcohol, drugs, stress, even basic aging reduce that bacteria. And as that occurs, the opposite process ensues. You get poisons, rashes, get sick, and unfortunately a lot of the nutrition is simply now waste. You don't want that to happen. Here's a natural way to replace your body's natural process. Megadopolis, Bifidofactor, and Digestalac. You'll never remember all those names. They happen to be Natrin's Healthy Trinity. So, get back in step naturally and get Natrin's Healthy Trinity. Call 1-800-992-3323. That's 1-800-992- 3323. Again, 1-800-992-3323. One other little item, $100 bills. Um, we've got new ones. And all the people that have called me said they are the, uh, say they are very ugly. Very ugly. Why didn't they do more testing on what the American people would like and not like? They just slammed it together, I guess. Everybody I've talked to doesn't like the new hundreds. Uh, anyway, that is the least of the reason to be talking about this. But they are ugly. There is more new ugly money to come. Other denominations, new denominations, will be on the way. They say that the bills in Russia and elsewhere in the world, $100 U.S. bills, are different internationally. That opens the way toward a domestic eventual devaluation, which is no doubt inevitable and I have yet to uh, talk to anybody who's looked into this who would challenge that view. It's just inevitable. Do the numbers. North American Trading would be happy to tell you what this will mean to you, what the rest of the story on the new currency is. Call them. The call is free and the information is free. And if you don't uh, take it, then you've just got your head in the economic sand. And somebody's going to come along and kick you in the economic rear. And you won't even be uh, seeing it coming. 
Uh, remember, uh, the number is 1-800-877-9799. The information is free of charge. 1-800-877-9799. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Art. This is Mike from Longmont, Colorado. Yes, sir. Hi, I'd like to talk to you about the bookings report. Okay. Um, I have a problem with, uh, with your view in that, uh, we wouldn't be able to handle it, or at least the majority of people in the United States wouldn't be able to handle it. Well, I didn't say that they couldn't. I said some people clearly would not be able to handle it. Do you challenge that? Well, I, I believe that they wouldn't, but I have a bigger problem with the fact that we're dealing with um, a deception as it is, and I see that as a larger problem. If we start getting to some truth about what's out there and about how everything works, um, it might end up being more beneficial than non-beneficial. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. There's a lot of people who feel that way. Uh, but the question is not about them. The question is about the, I admittedly, the minority, but still a large number of people, numerically, who would go batsoid. I, th I think that's definitely possible, but... Uh, I, I think well, that, that there'd that, be that, a lot of ways... For okay, sir, that, that, that is definitely the worry. Now, we've got to break it off there. Heading toward the top of the hour, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, next, maybe. Toll free, west of the Rockies at 1-800-618-8255, 1-800-618-8255, east of the Rockies at 1-800-825-5033, 1-800-825-5033, this is the CBC Radio Network. It is indeed. Good morning everybody, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, Apollo 14 astronaut with us in a moment. The new Trope 900 NDL telephone is on sale. You have never seen such a sale before. It is $159.95. Now, that's $20 off to begin with, which is crazy. But the Seagrain Company is now throwing in an extra battery and charger along with the deal. It's even crazier. What a deal. This telephone, because it is all digital, is private. Nobody sits out there on another telephone, baby, uh, baby monitor, uh, or scanner or anything else listening to you. It's private. I get about a mile out of mine, but of course I'm in the desert without a lot of intervening geography. You might get that or less or more. I don't know. So you get great distance. Best of all, though, it is clear, just like a phone you would plug into the wall. So you get all those advantages, and I've never seen a sale like this. One fifty nine ninety five with the extra battery and charger. That's the deal. Call them in the morning at nine o'clock, nine a.m. Saturday morning, or uh, seven thirty Monday morning. It's one eight hundred five two two eight eight six three. That's one eight hundred five two two eight eight six three. One correction to the Associated Press article I had: uh, the baby, uh, the baby that is now in critical condition, was beaten by the six-year-old. Is in uh, was not at at home alone. As a matter of fact, there was a babysitter there, according to late uh, news. Not the best supervision, but not left alone. All right, uh, now we go to Florida, and that's where Dr. Edgar Mitchell is. Dr. Mitchell, welcome to the program. Well, good morning, Art. Thank it you. is it is really an honor to have you on the show. Well, thank you. I'm pleased to be here. Um, good. Uh, I've got a million questions, which probably are dumb. Everybody asks astronauts these questions, but I've got to do it because I've never heard the answers. Well, give me the first hundred thousand or so. Yeah. All right. Um, how did you get picked uh, to be in the Apollo program? I guess that's a good place to begin. Well, I kind of made it my business from 1957 on after Sputnik went out. I uh, recognized that humans were probably right behind robot spacecraft, and I wanted to go along, so I started working on it on my credentials in 1957, even before there were manned flight, uh, much more than a 
dream. It took me nine years, uh, adding to my test pilot credentials, getting a PhD from MIT, and uh, being involved in space development uh, with the military. So it's sort of like you had a list, or you knew what the right stuff was going to be, or was going to require, and you, you began fulfilling it. That's kind of right. I didn't quite exactly know about it. I just kept adding credentials and uh, qualifications and hoping that sooner or later they couldn't ignore me any longer, which turned out to be true uh, by 1966. All right. Well, most people today, because all of this occurred so long ago, have forgotten a lot about it. Mm -hmm. What reminded them about it all was Apollo 13. That's true. Of course. And... Uh, would would you say, uh, to the best of your knowledge, that Apollo 13, minus a little bit of dramatic license, was fairly correct? Oh yes, there was very little dramatic license uh, in Apollo in the movie Apollo 13. It uh, they did a marvelous job of keeping it right on track and um, uh, very very true to true to actually what happened. All right, uh, bearing that in mind, and with a lot of people who've seen 13, the movie. Um, Going on 14 uh, must have been a bit of a, even though I'm sure by then you were uh, all locked into it and ready, still, in the back of your mind, uh, with Apollo 13 just having occurred, you must have worried that a similar thing could have occurred. <clears throat> on the contrary, uh, took the position, hey, we've really gone over the spacecraft with a fine-tooth comb, the likelihood of something of lightning striking twice in the same place is pretty small. Uh, at least it's nice consolation, whether it's true or not. Uh, mathematically true is another matter, but it's nice consolation. Our, the main problem was don't screw up. We, we really uh, we were under the gun to fly a good mission, and so the, to ourselves, don't mess up. Uh, do it right. Mm -hmm. Um. I guess my simple little question was, uh, and it is a simple question, when you got to the moon, when you got on the moon, was it fun? Fun? Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, was there time in between everything you had to do to just, you know, sort of feel the experience for yourself and have fun? No, there wasn't time. A any moment that you uh, took to do that was very brief, stolen, uh, the, the clock did not permit that time, but of course, Alan Shepard took the time to hit a golf ball. Yes, he did. I took the time to throw a javelin further than his golf ball. And uh, how far did your javelin go? Uh, well, both of them went out there uh, <laughs> a, a few yards. If we had uh, been, hadn't been such cumbersome, tight pressure suits, we could have done a pretty respectable job of throwing things halfway around the moon. But it, uh, those pressure suits were tight and and uh, stiff and difficult to work with. Was there any, went out there a while. Was there any chance that uh, should you fall in one of those, you would catch it on a, a rock or a jagged and tear it? There's a possibility. Uh, we were careful with regard to that and watched each other pretty cautiously. Uh, you know, kept an eye on each other, worked the buddy system, and tried to make sure we didn't uh, fall on any, anything really sharp. But it was... A remote probability, but it was still there. If something like that had occurred, mm -hmm. would it be automatically fatal, or would there have been time to do a quick patch job, assuming it wasn't a giant tear and something you'd live through? We had uh, we had ways to uh, overcome small small fissures or small holes in the, the suit, leaks in the suit. Uh, for short periods of time, we had a buddy system. We had a uh, uh, emergency oxygen supply that could uh, hold up for very small leaks and that's about all that uh, we really expected to encounter were it a massive tear it would be, it'd be all too difficult to, uh, to manage um, did you ever have any concern or did you give any thought to uh, what would have occurred if the LEM had not been able to lift off from the moon and I wonder how they could have handled that from a PR point of view at Houston. Uh, well, we had about five ways to back up the uh, the engine ignition and the start sequence. Fortunately, we didn't have to use any of them, but we had several different uh, backups, the last of which was to run a jumper cable from the descent stage through the hatch into the 
ascent stage uh, circuit breaker panel. Uh, so we always wondered what would happen when that uh, that uh, cable went snaking out through the, the front door as we left it off, but, yes. that was, but we never had to use that. So, uh, so there wasn't much thought that anything tragic. Well, happened. there was a lot of thought, prior thought, uh, of backup, of creating backups for things that could go wrong. But once you've done that, you've done all you can do. Uh, we went to the moon and went to the moon and went to the moon, and now we haven't gone to the moon, and it's been 30 years, and a lot of people, and I'm one of them, wonder about that. Why haven't we been back? Why haven't men been back? The uh, public hasn't supported it financially. That's the reason we cut off the last three flights. Is the, uh, the public started saying, ho oh, hum, uh, so what have you done for us today? Why go back to, why go back to the moon? Scientifically, there is plenty of reason to go back, and eventually we will. But we have to garner the public will, public and political will, and finances to do it. It will happen sooner or later. Would it, would it be so? How much uh, the the Saturn V? That's what you rode on top of, isn't mm -hmm. it? That was uh, quite an incredible booster. How much thrust did that develop? A little over seven million pounds, about seven point three million pounds. Seven point three million pounds. Um, it's hard to imagine what it, um, it's like sitting on top top of a giant firecracker, isn't it? No. Yeah, I, I compare it to the uh, vertical subway ride, <laughs> kind of shaking, rattling, and rolling as the gimbals uh, move the vector around, and with acceleration, you're being pushed back in the seat ever ever more firmly until you reach first stage cutoff of a minute or so. About a minute and 20 seconds of the flight. How many G's at that point? Not too many, a little over four. The, the liftoff is re relatively light. It's the, the emergency reentry that pushes you up to high G loads, potentially up to 16, oh 16 and a half G. We practice that, and it's not a comfortable feeling to practice emergency aborts. What is human endurance for G's, roughly? Depends on how you're taking it, transverse G's through the body like we were taking it. Uh, you're going to start to black out uh, above 16 if you, if you sustain it too long. But you can take a jerk or short impulses uh, higher than that. You may tear a few blood vessels, uh, but you'll survive it. I, I don't really know what the absolute limit is. Uh, they tested that out in the White Sands <coughs> by <coughs> Colonel Harold Stapp. Mm -hmm. Tested it out in the White Sands back in the 60s with with rocket sleds that they brought to a screeching halt up to 20 or 30 Gs, as I recall. Wow. Uh, and now they sustained a bit of damage sometimes doing that. What would you... Uh, was there any surprise for you uh, on the moon? Was there anything you found on the moon that you didn't expect to find? <laughs> well, not along the lines you're talking about. Uh, the only big surprise was it was much more difficult to navigate than we thought because it looks like a fairly smooth surface where we landed, relatively smooth. But it turns out the undulations of the, the crater impacts the, uh, are, are like sand dunes, and they're much higher than you think they are. So whereas we thought we could uh, navigate across the surface very, very precisely within inches if we wanted to. Uh, it turns out you couldn't do that because you lose sight of your landmarks. Just like walking through the desert with sand dunes. Uh, you come over one sand dune and sure. lo and behold there's another one and you can't quite see what's over the next one. Would that have uh, blocked your, in other words, with that kind of geography uh, which is hillier then you thought, would that have uh, blocked your view, or did you have a great view to the moon moon's horizon? Oh, we had great views. What I'm talking about is micro-navigation here. Oh, I see. Okay. Down to within feet or so. We knew where we were within uh, 10, 15 yards, but uh, not within 10 or 15 feet sometimes, like the geologist wanted us to have. Hmm. A lot of people uh, thought the early Apollo missions might, you know, when the limb came down, might go sinking into the moon mm -hmm. dust, and there was going to be a great deal of moon dust there. Yep. And a lot of people thought that. Well, there was a great deal of moon dust. It just turned out it was uh, it compacted very nicely, and the big uh, uh, pads we had on the on the bottom of the of the struts uh, cushioned it very nicely, and we didn't sink in. All right, uh, let me try this one on you. It's a fax. I have several. 
Uh, regarding your appearance on Dateline, NBC's Dateline, uh, a few minutes into the interview, if you had missed it, you would have missed the commentator's remark that Dr. Mitchell returned from the moon with a couple of secrets. So if he's unable or unwilling to cooperate, Richard Hoagland's work, and we'll get to that <laughs> later, I'd like to know if it's true that there are some secrets. Uh, it, is, there, is there anything, any secret uh, that that you learned that you still are unable to discuss? Absolutely not. No, the secret she was referring to uh, was a little teaser for the fact that I did that uh, ESP experiment, telepathy experiment. Mm -hmm. um, but there, I have no classified information or information I can't talk about, talked about everything I know to talk about in regard to flight. Of course, if you had classified information that you couldn't talk about, then... You, you couldn't obviously talk. couldn't talk about it, right? So. No, but uh, yes, that is true, except for the fact I deny that uh, that's the case. So, no, so we were a totally open program. We had uh, uh, nothing to hide. Uh, we were to tell the world what we found, and as far as, as far as whatever we saw, we can talk about it. All right, I don't shy away from things. Here's another fax. He says, don't ask this directly. You may not be able to broach the subject without causing some tension between you and your guest. Um... Edgar Mitchell's company, this fact says, has been and is still funded by the CIA. Absolutely untrue. Absolutely untrue. No, I, uh, if you recall, back in the early 70s, I did work with, uh, at Stanford Research Institute with Harold Putoff and Russell Targ and Uri Geller and all that. And I was invited to brief the CIA on our results, which I did. Mm -hmm. uh, George Bush was uh, head of the CIA at that time, and subsequently a great deal of work was done by CIA on psychic work, and uh, very successfully because the Soviets were doing it at that time as well in the Brezhnev area, very successfully. And as a matter of fact, uh, much of that work has just been declassified and released to the public within the last few months. It's true. Harold Putoff uh, has written, and Russell Targ both have written several papers uh, just in this year, after 20-some years of secrecy, uh, about all of that work. And it was very successful work and very exciting. But as far as funding my company and any of my efforts, no, I've never had one penny of CIA funding. Okay. Uh, you did conduct an ESP experiment. It is now known. What uh, what were the results of that experiment? What did you do? Well, the standard sort of test that uh, had been done in the laboratory by J.B. Ryan and other people for 30 years or more, I just simply conducted it in that environment. And I can only quote the results statistically because that's the way it was set up. The probability that chance could have produced our results was... Uh, one in 3,000. One in 3,000. So it was statistically a significant uh, test. So you had arranged, I guess, with somebody on Earth to be receiving, and you were going four to... Four people. Four people, and you were going to send a message. Mm -hmm. uh, what, mid-flight? No, I did it four different times. Planned to do it more than that, but I was, had time to do it four different times during my rest period. It took about seven minutes each time to organize the standard Zinner symbols in accordance with random numbers selected from uh, a random number table and copied onto my knee pad. Mm -hmm. And I organized the symbols according to random orientation of the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then simply thought about each symbol in turn for 15 seconds. And, and, and the result was uh, that uh, it, it would have been 1 in 3,000. It could have been... That chance could have produced that result. That result. Um, that's incredible. Yeah, uh, it, was, it was very significant. It was quite in keeping with what scientists had found in the laboratory for 30 years or more. Did NASA know you were going to do that? No, they did not. Had they known, would they have been happy? Not particularly. No. <laughs> uh, how did uh, you decide to concoct that experiment? Well, as I uh, tell in my book that's coming out, as a, I had... Uh, been in discussion with some other, with some medical people, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. who were very good scientists and who were frustrated with the um, establishment's lack of interest in 
these human capabilities. And it seemed like too good an, uh, too good an opportunity to pass up <laughs> because no one had ever been able to conduct an experiment over those distances. Now, it's a simple experiment. It didn't show a lot because one set of experiments is never enough. But uh, it was indicative, and um, the only problem with it only problem was that it got broken to the press before we were ready to and before we had had chance to uh, analyze the results and do it in a thoroughly scientific, uh, proper way. Care to say how it got out? The um, One of our persons involved in it, uh, who happened to have been a professional psychic, uh, couldn't contain himself, got too excited and leaked it to the press. <laughs> I see. Um, all right, let me jump to something else here. You, um, on Dateline, virtually suggested that you think, your opinion, so it's safe to say that, is that uh, there was really perhaps a, cro a crash in 1947 in Roswell, and that it uh, has been covered up. Is that roughly accurate? Yeah, that's pretty accurate. I, uh, let me give a little background. I uh, lived in Roswell at the time, but I was too young, of course, to be know much about that incident, although it was not too far from my parents' ranch. Yeah, interestingly enough, and also as I point out in my book, uh, Robert Goddard lived right down, this, right down the road from where I grew up mm -hmm. in Roswell. Walked past his house on the way to school every day. Um, so the Roswell area is of interest to me. I have, I remember that incident vaguely. Remember the headlines and um, didn't think much about it at the time when it was uh, said, well, it's just a weather balloon. But the subsequent events and the people who have come forth uh, in later years saying that they were told to keep quiet, and but they don't want to keep quiet anymore, uh, and the many, many investigations of it suggest that there's really more to it than uh, has been told. Over. I think there's in the order of about 130 witnesses. Yeah, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of people, yes. And many of them now in later stage of their life saying we really don't want to go to our our grave uh, uh, with this misinformation now. Um, there are a lot of people who would say the same thing about you. In other words, mm -hmm. that you wouldn't want to go to your grave with secrets about the moon. Now, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to beat this to death, but I'm going to ask you. Uh, Please do. Ask it directly. Richard Hoagland claims that know, there are know. great glass structures mm -hmm. uh, on the moon, and he presents photographs, including one, I might add, of you on the moon in which he claims uh, reflections in your visor are showing things that were in front of you that uh, you have not admitted were there. Mm -hmm. Well, I will uh, refer, the, the kindest thing that can be said is what the uh, Washington Post said, uh, green cheese and bologna, it simply is not true. Simply it's, not true. It's pseudoscience, it's just nonsense. Um, Alan Bean, I think, gave a quick comment, a proper comment. I happened to be uh, uh, out of pocket at the time this press conference took place a month ago. Uh, but Alan Bean's comment is absolutely correct. Had we discovered such a thing, we would have been totally delighted to reveal it to the public. Uh, and he was also, uh, in tongue and cheek, said, I would have loved to have gone to collect the Nobel Prize for, for uh, having such a discovery. Uh, no, there simply was nothing like that. All right, Doctor, stay right there. Take a break. It'll be about four or five minutes. We'll be back with more. Apollo 14 astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell is our guest, and he's written a book. Get a pencil, get a paper, because he's going to offer you an opportunity to get an autographed copy of his book, dedicated autographed copy. You'll never get that chance again. We'll be right back. On the wild card line at 702 
702-727-1295. That's 702-727-1295. First time callers can reach Art Bell at 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222. Now, here again, Art Bell. Once again, here I am. Good morning, everybody. Back to Apollo 14 astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell in a moment. If you've got hard water, you've got a very hard problem. And there are various ways to condition water, mostly with chemicals that are bothersome, cumbersome, annoying, with machines that break. And now there's GMX. It is magnetic water conditioning, and it really, really works. I've had it in my home for, oh, I don't know, going on three years now. And I couldn't be more satisfied. What it does is it does not remove the minerals, that particulate matter that constitutes hard water. It simply changes them so they become Teflon-like. Teflon. Not really Teflon, but Teflon-like. Another product, by the way, of the space program. And so as a result, they don't stick to pipes, glassware, cars, anything else when you wash it. But they're still in the water, actually still in there. So when you drink your water, you get minerals. So you get the benefits of conditioned water without the drawbacks. Salt and water, that sort of thing. It's a $600 one-time cost, and it uh, means you get magnetic arrays on the incoming water pipes to your home and your water heater as well. It's uh, quite a remarkable system, actually, and you'll love it. Anyway, you've got a 90-day money-back guarantee, so if you don't love it or don't perceive that it works as I have said, you get your money back. Period. No hassle. The number to call, 1-800-4060-GMX. That number again, 1-800-4060-GMX. It's magnetic water conditioning, and though there's great controversy about it, I'm here to tell you it really works. If you suffer from headaches, neck aches, sports injuries, low back discomfort, arthritis, rheumatism, bursitis, menstrual pain, joint pain, any kind of pain... Let me tell you about Leprina. No more waiting for pain relievers to kick in. No more settling for alternative pain relievers just because your system is aspirin sensitive. Just spray on Leprina topical aspirin and enjoy soothing relief without side effect. It really is that easy. And it works. It actually penetrates the skin right down to where the pain is. Remember the name, Leprina. That's Leprina. You're going to be hearing a lot about this remarkable product, believe me. I've used Leprina on my bad back, and the fast-acting results are truly amazing. Spray it on, the pain's gone. Some pain sufferers are calling the almost instant results miraculous, but you cannot get it at your local drugstore. If you want fast-acting topical pain relief, just order Leprina by calling 1-800-308-4565. That's 1-800-308-4565. The truly reasonable cost is a bargain for this revolutionary new product. And when you call, be sure and ask the folks at Health Naturally how you can get Leprina at an even greater savings. Call 1-800-308-4565. Just spray it on and the pain is gone. All right, back now to Florida. And my guest, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, Apollo 14 astronaut. Uh, doctor, this uh, question does not relate to you because of the nature of your crew on Apollo 14, so don't take it that way. But one day, if America is to ever, uh, or any nation on this globe, I guess, is ever to launch a um, spacecraft to elsewhere, truly to elsewhere, beyond our system, uh, in what will be a very long space flight, there may have to be generations, literally, of people to accomplish that fact, unless we can start moving a lot faster than light. Um, toward that end, I would think that NASA would have, but wouldn't talk about, a great interest in whether it would be possible to procreate in space, mm -hmm. uh, or the nature of procreation, and that leads to whether there's ever been sex in space, and we talked about that one night, and you seem like person person to ask, uh, do you think there has been? I can't answer that from definitive knowledge. I understand. Uh, but but sooner, sooner or later there's going to be. Uh, uh, there may very well have been, but uh, I don't know of any official experiments for that. Uh, there, there may be just a... an extension of what aviators always talked about, the mile high club. I mean, you're just getting up there 100 miles high, that's all. 
I think it would be irresistible, wouldn't you? Yeah. Uh, and there must be a file in the back of somebody's file drawer about that. I mean, it, it is, a, a, at the same time, an interesting question, a fun question, and a question that is very serious, or could sure. potentially be very serious. Well, we, we certainly need to consider it because, as you point out, long-distance space flight it can take years and years, even though, by the way, as a matter of interest, there's a lot of work going on at the moment to modify, learn to modify the basic characteristics of uh, local space in order to change the speed of light so locally one could exceed the speed of light. Uh, Wait a minute. Not really exceed the speed of light, but, but it would appear that one is exceeding the speed of light. Is this a theory that embraces uh, virtually folding, sort of folding... Uh, Space so that you, in effect, mm. jump from point to point. No, that's uh, that is the uh, wormholes or tunneling tunneling approach. No, this is uh, goes right to the very definition of what is the speed of light, and it's the uh, electrical and the magnetic permeab. It's associated with the electric magnetic permeability of the uh, of the medium, and if you can modify that, then you could modify the apparent speed of light. But it's very far out. There's just a few papers been written on it, and it's being looked at at this point. But it holds some promise uh, from a from a scientific point of view. Very, very hard nosed uh, approach to it. All right. One of the things uh, that Richard Hoagland may not be so far out on, and that you may wish to comment on, is he talks about a new type of physics that seems to sound a lot like what Tesla. Uh, worked on that that seems to relate to something you've talked about this zero point energy. Yeah, well, I must not give Hogan credit for that. that. It's sure it's closer, much closer to Tesla's work, but a number of physicists, including Hal Putoff, whom I'm very close to, Tom Bearden, others have been working with zero point field concepts. And I was just discussing what I was just discussing comes out of zero point field work. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> uh, that the zero point field is the underlying quantum field of quantum fluctuations that supports all matter. And in space, you'd call it the, the, um, what, why am I blocking? It's, it's space energy. It's, uh, it's energy that's all around us. All around us, everywhere. And it is <clears throat> the fundamental fluctuation that's left over if you were to reduce, uh, space to, well, the space is zero degrees Celsius. It's the uh, quantum fluctuations that remain at zero degrees Celsius. Or you could also say it's the source of the Big Bang. It was there, and the Big Bang arose out of the zero point field. Um, does it seem likely to you, Doctor, that uh, a that the Big Bang is the is the correct theory? Well, all the evidence it gets stronger and stronger and stronger the more you look at it. That there's something like the Big Bang. The problem is not with the Big Bang itself. It's with what happens in the first few nanoseconds of, mm. um, of the event and defining precisely uh, what happens at each instance. And they're narrowing in on that. But something close to the way the current des standard description of the Big Bang did take place. If, uh, if it's the Big Bang or some modification of the Big mm. Bang, then doesn't it follow that w w if um, Roswell really occurred, if there really was a crash at Roswell, or there have been others, or there are others to visit, that any materials gathered would likely, frankly, be very much like the materials we have here on Earth. In other words, all well, yeah, well, sure. materials sourced uh, from a common the, the In my own book, uh, I discuss this at considerable length. What uh, <clears throat> really comes out of it is that uh, the Big Bang tells us that all matter is interconnected in some way. And this comes out of an experiment only 12 years ago called the Aspect Experiment, uh, or more formally Bell's Theorem, which has been tested and proven to be correct, that matter once in connection or correlated with each other remains correlated in some sense. And I trace this up to being responsible for what we experience as our inner experience non-locality is the correct term and we experience our ESP, our intuition our creativity as a result of that very fundamental physical relationship that's, that exists in nature and um, it's always existed in nature and it's responsible for us 
having our inner experience the way we have them. Mm -hmm. um, going to space, going to the moon, mm -hmm. uh, was it at some level a very spiritual experience? What, and this was what uh, got all of this going as far as I'm concerned. It was the perception in looking at the cosmos, seeing the stars, seeing the galaxies, seeing the galactic clusters, the profusion of billions and billions and billions of stellar objects uh, with this tiny little Earth set in the midst of it, mm. and perceiving that the molecules of my body, of that spacecraft we were in, of each other, of everything around us, were all manufactured in those ancient stars. And that our story about ourselves from science was incomplete. And our cosmology about how we came to be from our cultural traditions and our religions was archaic. Mm -hmm. That we needed a new story. And that new story was what is it that makes us conscious? What is, why is it that we're aware of beings like we are? And the answer to it, to that question, is centered around what I have been doing for the last 25 years, um, trying to find what is, what's going on here. Our answers are not complete, but I think after 25 years of working at it, we're getting pretty close to a good answer. And it does involve a zero-point field. It does involve quantum physics. It does involve, involve spiritual experience, mystical experience, parapsychological functioning. Uh, all of those things have to be satisfactorily answered if we're to know what it is we are. Do you think it would be more devastating uh, to learn there are others of greater uh, technical capability or more devastating to learn there are not? Oh, more devastating to know there are not. I think it's absolutely wonderful to know when you first start with the idea this universe is full of life. It's full of intelligent life. The fact that some of it might be a little bit more advanced or happened a little earlier than our civilization uh, seems natural. Uh, if life is throughout the universe, which is quite a different concept than we held 25, 30 years ago. Uh, but now I think that's, that is the case. And if the universe is approximately 15 billion years old or so, give or take a few, uh, it would <clears throat> not be strange that Maybe a civilization could be a few million or even a billion or so years older than we are. Do you think we're ready to know that now? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Well, surely many are, and I, get, I would be certain you would be, and I would be. But there was the Brookings report that suggested a great many people in our society would not be ready. I think that's probably true, but not nearly like it was um, uh, 25 years ago. A recent study done by my own institute uh, demonstrates that has broken the demographics down into three different groups called the traditionalists, the moderns, and the postmoderns. And the postmoderns, uh, another name for them is called cultural creatives, mm -hmm. which is the group like you and I are that are looking for new answers, uh, looking for where the future is, not afraid of these ideas. That group has changed from 2% to 24% in the last 20 years. Uh, and is in equal in size in the United States, we're talking about the U.S. demographics, equal in size to the traditionalist and the uh, moderns, or the moderns would be your corporate people, your uh, materialist scientist, uh, the yuppie group, and so forth. Uh, and the cultural creators would be the greens, the uh, environmentally sensitive people uh, looking to the future. All those groups are now roughly the same size with the cultural critics increasing and the others decreasing. All right, look, you've got a book, and I, I, want to pl I want to plug it for you. It's called The Way of the Explorer. Can you give us, uh, I'll tell everybody how to get the book and stuff in a moment, but can you <laughs> give us an idea of what The Way of the Explorer tells sure. us? We, um, I talk a, a bit about the space experience, of course, how I got into all of that, and but most of the book and the these, these story of... Uh, looking at the universe and being awestruck by what I was experiencing. Uh, but most of it is the research of the last 25 years going into these various topics, the mystical experience, the parapsychological experience, the studying consciousness, how does it relate to our psychology, to our religion, mm -hmm. to our mystical experience, to our science, uh, and giving my thoughts on it and my work of the last 20-some years. 
and coming to a new model called the dyadic model of how it relates, how what all what does all this mean to us, and where does it seem to be taking us in the future? And I touch upon the UFO experience a bit, the the notion that intelligent life is probably throughout the universe, and the real question is, have we found each other yet? All of these items are touched upon, some of them in significant detail, and it's kind of the result of my last 27 years of, of research. Um, but it's, it's hung upon an autobiographical story, and the people who have read it say, hey, that's a pretty interesting tale. You got there, <laughs> uh, if another a group of people from elsewhere had uh, been watching us, or mm -hmm. if we had been observed, then surely those moments when we left our planet in a significant way beyond low Earth orbit or even uh, geosynchronous orbiting satellites, those moments would have been, I would think, of intense interest to somebody else. And so obviously the question, did you uh, en route to the moon or back see anything at all that was anomalous? No. I wish we had. Uh, I mean, these, these stories and rumors have been around for years, but uh, I have had no experience, none on our flight, and to my knowledge, no unexplained experience on any of the flights that, uh, in this regard. And yes, it, in an evolutionary sense, an extraterrestrial uh, intelligence would be very curious about the evolutionary progress that a civilization they discovered had made. So if we were watching somebody's first steps into space, we'd be intensely curious about it. All right. Um, this is something that had to have been covered by NASA, though you say it didn't happen. Had there been contact, had you seen another craft, met something on the moon, seen something on the moon, what was the protocol? Was there a protocol? There was none. In other words, you guys would just get on the mic and say, hey, Na hey Houston, guess what? Yeah, exactly. Because the official position at that point in history, it cannot happen. This doesn't exist. So it wasn't even discussed. Had it happened, it would have been exactly that. Hey, guys, Houston, look what, <laughs> guess what's happened? Really? Yeah. Um, I would have thought uh, there would have been at least some private, secret code word or contact or something before you just blurted out, uh, you know, a whole thing out publicly? No, huh? <laughs> nope. It was considered, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, considered such a, a remote event that it wasn't even discussed. Now, did any of us individually think about it? Sure and say, well, that would have been curious. That would have been nice. <laughs> All right, you've got a very, very unusual offer for everybody, and you're going to be inundated. Uh, your book, The Way of the Explorer, you're willing to actually autograph, autograph versions for people and even dedicate them, is that correct? Sure, sure. Really? Give, give me their name. the name, I'll dedicate it to the person that uh, uh, sends in me. Send the money in. All right, it's thirty-five bucks, right? Right. A special dedicated autograph version, and uh, they would send that thirty-five dollars. I suppose uh, check money order that sort of thing. Yeah, check money order, cash, whatever. whatever. Uh huh. To P.O. Box six seven two eight sixty seven twenty eight Lake Worth two words Lake Worth Florida zip code three three four six one. Now, I'll do that again. Uh, the book, uh, the title of the book, The Way of the Explorer, Post Office Box 6728, Lake Worth, Florida, 33461. And uh, you know not what you do. Oh, you know not what you do. <laughs> I'm telling you, I wrote a book. I signed uh, autograph versions. You're going to be at this for a long, long time. Thank you for the warning, Ernst. <laughs> um, you remember 2001? The obelisk, yep. all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. uh, as you reflect, uh, Doctor, on, on, on what it all means or uh, how we came to be, and that's what we're all asking, uh, do you consider that a possibility that, uh, that life here on Earth was, in effect, jump-started one way or the other, obelisk or otherwise, by folks from elsewhere? I doubt if it really started that way. But there's some interesting uh, speculation by, um, uh, well, I think it blocked his name. It just blocked his name. Uh, he wrote the 12th planet. Uh, Zachariah Sitchin. Uh, Zach Sitchin. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that says, well, maybe they intervened along the way, and that the the historical biblical story out of out of Samaria.
Marriott, uh, could very well have been that sort of influence. I would love to have Sitchin's work either confirmed or denied by uh, additional scholarship because it's intriguing and he makes a very strong case and uh, it's uh, it's interesting stuff and it's quite possible. But I, I think we probably originated much like life originated elsewhere, Emmett. The model for that is what I give in my new book as to how that could possibly happen. Ah, uh-huh. interesting. Um, okay. uh, by the way, you know, we're also considering doing quite a bit of film work with this. I'm associated with uh, North Tower Films uh, out, out in California. Really? That uh, trying to get some of these ideas down on film because it's a modern, modern way to do it and into computers, into multimedia approaches. If any of your int- readers or our listeners are interested in that and in helping getting involved, uh, we could get them involved with that one too. And they would contact you at the same and address? Well, no, I've got a number for that. You can contact me, but the best thing is to go directly to, if you're interested in getting involved, uh, to North Tower Films, which is 415-868-1452. 145. Two. Look, looking for uh, funding. We have a very fine producer. Did you see the movie uh, uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Oh, yes. Oh, it's Robert Watts as a producer. Oh, okay. One of the producers, he does a marvelous job. Also did the Indiana Jones series and Star Wars tri- trilogy. He was involved with all of that. So he's a, a marvelous producer that uh, helped to do some of our work. And we're, we're trying to do some of this some of this work around what's coming out of this this new approach to uh, to science and to mystical approaches. Well, there, there is certainly a lot suddenly happening. Your statements, those that are going to be interestingly made May 7th, which is the date your book is coming out, mm-hmm. I know, by, by uh, Gordon Cooper on Paranormal Borderline. Uh, apparently some incredible statements coming. I don't have a full text, but the people that do have told me they're amazing statements. And a lot of people would say the things you have said, that Gordon Cooper will say, and others... Uh, are all leading up to something, that it's a slow sort of preparation, that's the way people feel, and that motion pictures are adding to that, you know, uh, Independence Day coming up, the big movie, Mm -hmm. the whole thing, that all of this is leading uh, to a sort of um, crescendo of information when there'll be some big revelation. Do you think that may be? Well, we're in an evolutionary universe. This is a major point I make in the book. We're evolving. We're continuously changing. We're Mm -hmm. continuously innovating. And what I believe is happening is that on our Earth, evolution is coming under our conscious control. And as a result, it's a, it's a new order of things. It's a new paradigm for the way we operate. In other words, the future of Earth is in our hands. All right, Doctor, hold it right there. That's a good place to hold it. We'll be back following the news at the top of the hour. My guest is Apollo 14 astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Yes, we will get phone lines open. Stay right there. Toll free, west of the Rockies at 1 800 618 8255. 1 800 618 8255. East of the Rockies at 1 800 825 5033. 1 800 825 5033. This is the CBC Radio Network. It is, I love doing that. Confusing my board ops. It's double bumping. This is Cusco. C U S C O. It is a group that uh, I've been using, actually, as bumper music now for years. Can you believe it's been years? And so they came to us and said, since you're selling so many albums for us, might as well advertise on your show. And here it is, the Cusco 2000 album. Cusco 2002 and the best-selling album, Mystic Island, you get three CDs for $39.95 or $27.95 for cassettes, both cases include postage to get them to your home but listen you include five dollars more and higher octave gives you 
two more CDs of music of the same genre. You like this, you like that. Five CDs now for less than the cost of three. You go straight to the source, Higher Octave Music. The number is 1-800-562-8283. Did you get that? 1-800-562-8283. You better hurry before this offer ends, and it will soon. Uh, also, let's talk for a second about comfortable sleeping. Do you uh, sleep well at night? No? Well, I've got the answer for you. It is Select Comfort. Select Comfort is a bed. It's unlike any other bed out there anywhere. It has within it individualized air chambers that either stiffen or slacken at your electronic command. You've got a little electronic command post on each side of the bed. And instead of water or springs, there are air chambers, and they adjust themselves to your sleep needs for that night. Select Comfort. It's incredible. Really, it is. And uh, we'll, all we're asking you to do is send away, actually call, a free number to get a free videotape to take a look at it. Then if you buy it, you get a 90-day risk-free in-home trial. You can't go wrong. The number is 1-800-448-5700. That's 1-800-448-5700. Now, Dr. Edgar Mitchell in Florida. Back once again, doctor. Mm -hmm. um, gee, it's great having you here. Oh, it's nice to talk with you. Um, Enjoying it. I've never... I've, I always wanted to talk to somebody who went to the moon and walked on the moon and... Uh, it's exciting to me. I wish, I guess I will never, that's one thing I will never get to do. And Oh, not necessarily. Well, that, that goes to the nature of my question, and that okay. is, now we're talking about a space station with the Russians, mm -hmm. and I guess the space program has not gone as aggressively as people like yourself, myself, might have wished it to. Where should the space program be going? If you had your druthers and money wasn't a problem, what would we be doing? Well, I think we're probably doing a lot of the right things right now. But in due course, we will do all of these these things. We will go back to the moon. We will go to Mars. We will go out to the solar system. We will even go beyond the solar system in due course, uh, sometime in the next century or so or beyond. But right now, I think we need to get our act together here on Earth. Uh, and the space technology is absolutely marvelous for surveying the Earth, uh, seeing our how to get ourselves better organized here, get, get things pulled together. Uh, it's quite apparent when you look at Earth from space that this thin, thin, thin little biosphere that we have uh, is, is rather in jeopardy. You know, we spotted the burning forest, the pollution uh, from space. It's very easy to see, and it's causing people to be very concerned. So getting ourselves organized, recognizing uh, who and what we are, what is our place in the cosmos, Making, laying our plans for the future is it's an appropriate thing to do now. We've only been in space about 30 some years and that's just nothing and we're just really starting to understand what this environment's all about. Does that overview uh, seeing the earth that way cause you to become an environmentalist? It certainly causes you to become far, to ask questions in a different way and most of the people who have been in space I would say are now if not ardent environmentalist, uh, certainly very sensitive to the environmental issues. It's very obvious from the space, uh, from the space overview. Uh, a lot of people have asked this, and I've always wanted to. A lot of people, doctor, who went to space, went to the moon, or uh, even in the early Mercury program, have had terribly troubling lives. Broken marriages, um, drug or alcohol problems, um, just generally have had trouble. But I, I would guess, and this is just my guess, that that's true of a lot of test pilots, too, people who live on the edge one way or the other. Is, that the, is that the answer to you? <clears throat> that's largely true. Uh, I think the, at the NASA program itself in the early days, we had very high family problems just because of the intensity, the dedication. Mm -hmm. uh, this idea of going to the moon back in the 60s was so exciting, and people were so dedicated that uh, the men and women, mostly men in those days, focused on their jobs, and families came second. And mm -hmm. that's just not the way you keep a family together. And uh, as a result, we had our casualties. And I think the timber of the times, as we see in American society in general, 
these times that uh, we're undergoing a transition and it has been very difficult on the families themselves but it's just a part of the times I believe in the intensity of this very marvelous program we were a part of uh, I want to dispel another rumor or it's actually more than that flying around on the internet mm -hmm. this great new information resource we have there are all these uh, texts uh, there are a lot of texts of supposed astronaut communications intercepted by amateur radio operators during blackout times about things they saw, most amazing things. Yeah. Um, all baloney? Well, uh, I can't, without analyzing them individually, I can't say they're all baloney, but by and large, I would say, uh, in a general statement, yeah, they're all baloney. Mm -hmm. uh, you and uh, uh, Gordon Cooper and others are probably considered within the astronaut corps to be kind of out on the edge yourself, are you not? Um, in, in some ways, yeah. Uh, do, you, have, do you expect others to come forward and say the kind of things that you've been saying? Oh, well, they have been. Some of them have, perhaps a little more guardedly. Uh, I've kind of made it my business for the last quite a few years to look very carefully, very critically at many of these frontier concepts to see what the validity they had. And we're finding many of them have a certain amount of validity. And as they have validity, you start to find ways to bring them into the body of our knowledge. And when you're a pioneer in that way, as I try to be, yes, you invite criticism. You invite uh, uh, the, the wise nods and mm -hmm. the shaking of heads and so forth. Yes. Uh, but that just goes with the territory of being an explorer. It does. Neil Armstrong is a good example. I can't give you the exact quote, but he went to the White House, I'm sure you've heard it, and said um, that there are places to go and things to see that will boggle your mind or mm -hmm. something very close to that. Yeah, and that's quite true. <laughs> well, that implies, uh, that implies a knowledge, though, that he has that he can't quite fully or is not willing to quite fully articulate, sort it's, of a, a tease. It's probably more not quite able to articulate. I have had exactly that same problem of a trying to explain what is the ineffable. And uh, that, that has always been the problem between science and our mystical experience. Science wants things precise, uh, well uh, defined, uh, and with exquisite precision. But most of our human experience doesn't have that precision. It has it's what we feel, it is uh, our reaction to an environment, and there aren't words to properly uh, describe it. If it were, then it wouldn't be such a mystical experience. All right, well, you, you have had the ultimate physical experience, the science experience of going to the moon. Do you think the ultimate answers that man seeks are going to be found in the hard sciences, or do you think that we will have to turn inward to find those answers? Science has to modify itself. And it's all centered around uh, one concept. It's the first person experience. Each one of us lives in our skin. Each one of us has an inner experience. Yes. That's the only experience we have. Science is concerned with describing that from the third person or objective point of view. And unfortunately, you cannot describe all first person point of view from the third person point of view. Hmm. That is where science breaks down. And the, the religious or cultural or subjective experience is all that each of us really has. That is the basis of our existence. And bringing science into understanding how to better deal with the personal subjective inner experience is what my studies have all been about. And that is really where the dividing line is here. All right. Here's something that I would like to ask you about. Maybe you can answer it in a way I haven't been able to, but those of religious faith, deep mm -hmm. religious faith, mm -hmm. many of them view discussion of UFOs, discussion of people or um, others that may be out there as of the devil. Mm -hmm. How do you react to that? Well, <laughs> this was, I, I grew up in a fundamentalist tradition. I tell the story in my book about my mother who was healed uh, amazingly in uh, one of these powerful things, uh, healing moments of very much the way uh, Jesus is supposed to have healed people. Only the interesting part was this fellow was a Buddhist shaman. And 
and he did a pretty marvelous job of uh, healing my mother. And she subsequently started thinking about it. What and did I described this in the book, by the way. What did she suffer? She had glaucoma mm -hmm. and was very surely going blind. She wore thick, by the time this happened, she wore very thick Coke bottle glasses and was legally blind without them. And uh, she was healed and could see, broke <clears throat> an interesting story, dropped her glasses on the floor, ground them under her shoe and said, son, praise the Lord, I can see. Wow. Drove home without her glasses 300 miles by herself. And if I were to say, the devil did that? Well, just let me finish the story. She <laughs> called me a week later and said, son, was this man a Christian? And I said, oh, Jesus, no, mother. I'm sorry, he wasn't. The next day she had to put her glasses back on. Had to go get new glasses. Her belief system wow. was so strong. Wow. That since she couldn't accept a Buddhist shaman healing I, her. I understand. She rejected the healing. Now, interestingly enough, Ten years later, when she passed away, she still hadn't had an operation because it was pretty risky back in those days. Uh, but she never went blind. Her eyesight improved over the years, the ten years remaining to her, hmm. so that by the time she passed away, she didn't, she wasn't, her glasses were a far weaker prescription than when this incident occurred. Oh, Very that's, amazing that's story. amazing. Got me started on all of this. Oh, it did? Well, that was a part, one of my earliest uh, experiences with consciousness and paranormal work, even before I ran into Uri Geller. Uri Geller came after that, and uh, I was had been studying with this shaman to see how in the world can this possibly happen. As a scientist, I wanted to understand it. Do some of your old colleagues come to you and say, Edgar, what are you doing? Yep. They do? <laughs> fact is, they did uh, right after the experiment in space, that many of them... Uh, came in, closed the door, looked around nervously, and said, tell me about it. Uh -huh. And it's been happening for 20-some years. And so you just told them about it. Right. I'll tell anybody to ask. Plow forward, obviously. Yeah. Um, there was a report last night, doctor. Mm -hmm. Last night, scientists, it, sa it says, are now calculating that asteroid 433, mm -hmm. uh, known as Eros, uh, will wander into Earth's orbit. Now, it's not a minor little uh, asteroid. It yeah. is the size of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Scientists are saying eventually uh, a collision with Earth is likely, maybe not for a million years, but and that's a long time, but uh, they, they calculate it will probably occur. Now, of course, that's far larger than the one that supposedly took out the dinosaurs. 50% probability. 50%. Half and a half. Well, all right. That's a big probability. That's a pretty good probability. And it's also not the only asteroid out there. Now, yep. um, potentially one day, something's going to come along that will do to us what was done to the dinosaurs. Quite possibly. Um, that's been a recent concern of scientists. So it's a good reason to have a space program in it. Yep. And you see, this illustrates what I'm talking about in our evolutionary path. We are indeed, these events can come under our conscious control by the time that might happen. See, it's not, uh, they say the probability is very, very low in the next 10,000 years, virtually zero. And within 10,000 years, we certainly would have the technology to divert an object like that mm -hmm. with uh, perhaps nuclear, uh, nuclear power or some such technology that we could invent by the time that happens. So that illustrates the fact we could bring this sort of natural disaster within our ability to pervert it or change it. We may not be able to get to earthquakes by that time, but again, we might. But certainly, it's feasible that we could divert an asteroid that was going to collide with it. All right. There are many who have uh, p prophets, people who claim to see. You mentioned earthquakes. Mm -hmm. uh, Gordon Michael Scallion, he's a fellow I work with, brilliant guy. Uh, others who see great earth changes coming, uh, great, great earthquakes coming. And indeed, I look at our society right now, we we're dealing with a story this morning of a six-year-old who may have or is uh, alleged to have planned the murder of a 30-day-old child, this sort of thing. Events socially, economically, politically seem to be in rapid deterioration, and mm -hmm. events appear to be quickening, uh, yep. geologic events uh, as well. Have you looked yep. at that? Well, yes, I have, and I just I described part of this in the book. Uh, I don't know that geologic events are accelerating, uh, but certainly 
well, in the sense that weather events, if they're influenced by the ozone layer, if they're influenced by the, the uh, global warming, the greenhouse effect, those can be traced to human activity. Uh, and if we can trace it to human activity, then yes, it's accelerating because every measure of human activity has a period of doubling now that is less than a human lifetime. It's the first time that's happened in all human history. Exactly. So it's bringing, it's what I'm saying, it's bringing all of these events are coming under human control. And it's because we're so numerous, our technology is so powerful, and it requires us now to rethink this whole issue of who are we, how did we get here, what's our future, where are we going, why and how. Well, whether you believe in a creator or you believe that our Earth is reacting to what is being done to it, there are a lot of people who believe, and I may be one of them, that the Earth uh, is in fact in some way, maybe perhaps just some natural way, reacting to, um, uh, to our presence or the changes we're bringing to Earth. Well, I happen to be one of them, too. You too and that's huh? exactly the sort of model I describe in my book, that uh, uh, this is an interactive, self-organizing system that we're talking about. And you push on it here, and the effect comes out over there right. in ways we don't really quite understand yet. Mm -hmm. And that's precisely what we must do is to take responsibility for and understand the consequences of our behaviors because we're doing some things that are quite reminiscent of the lemmings rushing toward the sea. <laughs> exactly. I'm uh, politically in a lot of ways conservative. but Me too. But uh, NASA has measured in recent years the ozone depletion. Mm -hmm. And I find it very difficult to be in denial regarding an 8 to 10 percent drop over North America, for example, in the size of the whole. Do you generally believe these measurements are accurate? Absolutely. The question here is not are the measurements accurate. The question is the meaning and the interpretation. And the evidence continues to mount that these are indeed man-made uh, events and that they're having a deleterious effect upon our whole ecological system. It's affecting the food chain. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the measurements are showing that it's affecting the food chain, clear down to the level of the newts, the frogs, the uh, life cycle of fishes, and so forth, which eventually works its way up to affect us. So we should be watching these indicator species, these... Very, very carefully, and recognizing that very likely we're causing the problem. As we take down the forest, the rainforest, uh, and as we venture into places we've never been before, we seem to be getting more Ebola's, more mad cow diseases, more mm -hmm. viruses that we can't explain and can't deal with. Mm -hmm. More of the same thing, Doctor? Mm -hmm. More of the same thing. Nature has a way, and I think my model that I present in this book it goes a long way toward helping us understand how this takes place. Uh, and essentially, nature is an an evolving, intelligent organism. We don't think of it as an organism due to our scientific history. We think of it as inanimate particles. That's right. But uh, the Lovelock Gaia hypothesis that everything is interconnected and interrelated more like an organism is a, probably a more productive way of thinking about nature. Closer to the Native American model. It's, it's very close to the, uh, to the Native American model and virtually all of the early models. Hmm. Yeah, and, if, and I think we will find it very productive if we continue to ex, uh, uh, develop that model of the interconnectedness of things and how everything relates to each other. And the fact that these effects take place is hardly disputable. It is the meaning or the interpretation that is in question here. Um, all right. Oh, fascinating. I... Um do you, do you think, given the direction that you see and I see, uh, we're headed toward a, a good outcome or, without change, a catastrophic outcome? Well, without change, it can be very catastrophic. But that is precisely the point. With change, with human awareness, with human willingness to take responsibility for some of these actions, then the outcome can be very, uh, very beneficial. What the futurist is looking for is sustainable processes. And right now, we're creating processes that are not sustainable. All right. A lot of my writing right now is on sustainability. Good. Dr.
Doctor, hold on. His writing is entitled The Way of the Explorer, and he's making you an offer this morning that I'm sure you can't refuse. I'm going to send off my 35. That's the name of uh, Dr. Mitchell's book, The Way of the Explorer, and he's willing to send you an autographed, dedicated copy. An autographed copy. I would grab this up. Uh, and the way you get it is send $35, check, money, order, cash, whatever. Really, you shouldn't send cash. Uh, to P.O. Box 6728, that's Post Office Box 6728, Lake Worth, that's two words, Lake Worth, Florida, 33461. And I'll do that uh, one more time. The Way of the Explorer, $35, to Post Office Box 6728, Lake Worth, Florida, 33461. When we come back, we'll begin to take a few calls. And by the way, uh, to, to my very, very good friend at Gateway, the answer is absolutely yes. Private message. We'll be right back. Taking calls on the wild card line at 702-727-1295. That's 702-727-1295. First time callers can reach our bell at 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222. Now, here again, Art Bell. Here again I am. My guest is Apollo 14 astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell. He'll be right back. Real Talk will help you never miss another important talk show. If you're tired of doing that, I know a lot of you are, fall asleep, get tired, have something else to do. Real Talk will take care of it for you. What it does is uh, it'll, it'll tape anything. It's an AM FM radio with a cassette deck built in that runs at one quarter speed. Now, very simply, this allows you to put up to three hours on a 90-minute cassette. Actually, one side of a 90-minute cassette. Imagine that. Three hours where normally 90 minutes would be captured. It is amazing. We will throw in uh, a 90 minute tape free of charge at, when you order Real Talk, which is now 144.95, and that includes shipping and handling to get it to your door. You can't beat it. That's Real Talk. It's uh, a real product. It's the hottest electronic item of the year, as well it should be for what it does. So if you're a talk fan, I'm sure this is one you can't do without. Call Bob Crane in the morning at 9 a.m. or 7.30 Monday morning, assuming there is still talk, talk, still stock of real talks. The number to call is 1-800-522-8863. That's 1-800-522-8863. I've always had great sympathy for friends who have allergy problems. You know, the runny nose, watery eyes, fits of coughing and sneezing. But now I've got an answer for them. See me, Lucen. That's right. See me, Lucen. It's a strange sounding name, but it's Switzerland's most popular allergy treatment. And here's the best part it's not only extremely effective, but it's all natural. No side effects or drug interactions, even safe for children. See me, Lucen is actually three products in one. First, the eye drops. They don't sting and burn, they can be used with any contact lens. Next, there's quick acting, non addictive nasal spray. And finally, there is a natural oral medication. Just a few drops under the tongue keeps allergies under control, actually fighting them off before they take hold. All this without causing drowsiness. Try Simi Lazen. It works. To order 24 hours a day, call 1-800-294-5885. The entire allergy package, just $29.95 plus shipping and handling. Call See Me Lazen at 1-800-294-5885. Neil Armstrong at the White House, July 20th, 1994. There are great, quote, there are great ideas undiscovered. Breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. There are places to go beyond belief. That, doctor, was what Neil Armstrong said. And the, the, that, part of the, that part of the line... To those who can remove one of truth's protective layers, seems awfully suggestive. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we do have a way, the way we organize information in our mind-brain. Uh, we have a way of protecting ourselves from shocking ideas. Uh, and if we want to be ultra, ultra cautious, we just let shocking new ideas kind of float over our heads and we don't yeah. buy into them. Yes. And that's one of nature's ways, are right? All right, this is something people have always asked. A lot of the film and video that was taken on the moon, a lot of the film and video that's been taken in space, for that matter, never seems, according to my faxer from Memphis, to show stars. And people have always wondered why. It shows the blackness of space, but you never see the stars. Any, any thoughts? Sure, that's because the, uh, if you squeeze the shutter down in order so that you get some definition of the thing you're looking at, you have excluded the starlight, which is much fainter. But if you were to uh, focus away from the sun and away from reflective light, open the shutter up, you won't see the stars. It's absolutely the same, true. Same thing is true on the lunar surface. Uh, if you look through our lunar surface telescope from the lunar module, you saw stars very, very nicely. But on the lunar surface, if you look out, you should see stars, but it's reflective light is bright enough that your eye shutter squeezes down, and your eyeball squeezes down, you don't see them unless you're very well shielded. And certainly on your camera, if you're going to catch the definition on the surface, you've got to shut the, close the shutter and you exclude the stars. Well, I can tell you that's true because I, I not long ago the shuttle came back uh, returning to Earth, and here in the desert we got a beautiful look at it very early in the morning, about mm -hmm. 4 o'clock in the morning. I went out with my camcorder, which is, you know, maybe one or two lux of good camcorder, and uh, it began as a great orange glow in the west and grew and then suddenly shot across the horizon with a big kaboom. Mm -hmm. And I thought I got it and I didn't get a doggone thing on my camcorder. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not enough light there. Not right. enough light there, exactly. Well, it's amazing how sensitive the eye is. Uh, you know, we did a, a wonderful experiment coming back from the moon in which we put eye shades on, uh, darkened the cabin, and um, then looked. And sure enough, we got meteor trails flashing across the eyeball, which were gamma rays, tiny really? little energetic solar particles flashing across the tissue of the eye, oh my. just like a, a meteor flashes across the sky. And the optic nerve is sensitive enough to pick up that single photon. Were there many worries, Doctor, that something the size of you know, a pebble or even a grain of sand would impact a spacecraft at high velocity and... That was all, that, that was um, uh, all part of the computation of how thick the spacecraft was and so forth. <clears throat> and sure, during, um, uh, during periods of high solar uh, sunspot activity, we shouldn't be in space, not because of meteor particles, but because of the Radiation. high en energy that could penetrate and damage our bodies. And there is always a possibility that a uh, high-velocity particle could fracture a spacecraft cabin. Sure. Hmm. A very All low right. probability, but it's there. All right. Uh, let's take a few phone calls, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Go ahead. All right. Uh, here we go. On the first-time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Mitchell. Hi. Hi, Art. Uh, this is Mary from Peoch, Nevada. Yes. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, um, mm -hmm. someone was listening to you when you came on the air this morning, and he worked with you on the ESP experiment. Can you use your ESP now and tell me who it was? I haven't any idea who it was. Uh, I can tell you if it's true if you tell me who it is, however. Uh, Olaf Johnson. Uh, yes, well... So Olaf is indeed the one uh, that uh, knew about it. He was involved. That's quite true. Well, and he also uh, let the press know, and that uh, got it all out in the public. That's right. Oh. There well, you are, anyway, man. He was listening to you this morning when you came on, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he was hoping that he could talk to you. Well, if he can get through, he can talk to Dr. Mitchell. Uh, would, you, would you have words for him? Have you had words for him uh, regarding his letting the press know about it? Uh, well, it was, uh, we'd hoped that that wouldn't happen. It did uh, cause a few difficulties in uh, keeping this within the scientific genre instead of a sensational, sensational genre. And, uh, but we did publish, you know, Dr. Ryan published the results, and everything works out the way it's supposed to, so I can't be too frustrated with uh, Olaf on that regard, but it would have been helpful if we'd announced it in a little more uh, measured way. 
you're not unhappy you did it. Oh, good heavens, no. Because it did indeed show us that what we were experiencing works exactly the same way in space as it does here. And subsequent, subsequent experiments in the laboratory have shown us that we don't have a space, uh, we don't have a, um, a uh, inverse squared effect like we do with, with other electro, with electromagnetic uh, effects, that it is truly a non-local effect we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Where are you, please? Kansas City. Kansas City, all right. Dr. Mitchell, honored yeah. to speak with you. The I'm question sorry? I have for you is, um, you speak a lot about spirituality, and you speak about that people will not be so paranoid in the future with what they find out, from what you believe we will find out. Uh, do you see, are you, do you have a religious feeling? Do you, I mean, do you believe that there is a higher being controlling us? I don't use the word being. <clears throat> I interpret it quite differently than that. Uh, <clears throat> I work with the idea of the God within rather than the God without. In other words, I consider the whole universe as divine uh, intelligence. That we must, as I write in my book, that we scientists uh, must rethink the problem that, that the gods do exist there throughout the universe. And I say to the theologian, your gods are too small. <laughs> that the whole universe is in the divine experience. And we just merely need to change the way, subtle way we think about it a little bit, and it all fits, as far as I'm concerned. So how would you explain life after death, or is there? Well, that's a lengthy one. Go, uh, read the book, and I do touch on that. I approach this from the point of view of energy and information, uh, that it's a very natural thing that's taking place, that uh, the information representing human life or the experiences of human life are indeed recorded, are indeed preserved is a better word. I call it the giant hard disk in the sky, facetiously. Mm -hmm. uh, and we now have a quantum mechanical mechanism, which we're writing about and studying right now, as to how that takes place. We have a pretty good handle, a pretty good theory on what, what's happening here. Doctor, I've always personally explained it by just believing that uh, creation, however it occurred, and a creator are not necessarily at all mutually exclusive. And that's right. Yep, that's fine. Right. There's I, no I reason the hand, the hand of uh, the creator could not have molded and started all this on its way. Yeah, exactly. It's like the, the details of the Big Bang. The details that we're talking about here are so fine that they become a little bit moot. But the fact is... Uh, this is a creative, organizing, intelligent universe. And the details of its beginning, we still don't quite grasp, but uh, perhaps we will in the future. Hmm. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Good evening. Oh, cool. Hi, this is Matt from Idaho. Hello, Matt. Hey, I can make a hobby of this. This is the second uh, moonwalker I've had uh, talked to. So. Who, uh, who else did you talk to? Uh, Buzz Aldrin on Larry King's show. Very good. About a year ago. Anyway, I, uh, I don't really have a question per se, other than uh, just a, a little personal experience that I had. As far as uh, Dr. Mitchell, when you talk about you know the experience of, of the oneness and whatnot, um, back in 1988, I was standing on the shore of uh, Jackson Lake, Grand Teton Lodge, um, Grand Teton Park, and it was a perfectly smooth lake on a on a cloudless, beautiful night. And I was standing there. The whole lake was like a mirror. And all of a sudden, I get, and it's, it's really hard to explain. It's like you said. But if you, if you do experience it, you'll never forget it. And it's just, yeah, that's exactly the point. It's, 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 the yeah. experience is sometimes ineffable. But once you have experienced it, uh, you never forget it. And it's very hard sometimes oh. to explain to someone else unless they've had the same experience. Then oh, you don't oh, need to explain it. Yeah, about the only thing I can say is that uh, the only, about the closest I could come to it is like it was almost like every every single cell in my brain um, just all of a sudden at once understood the whole thing. Yeah. Just for a in the book, in my book, I described this. Uh, the classical mystical experience is described in the literature as samadhi. This comes out of the Sanskrit, the ancient language of mysticism. Uh, 
and I describe this in the book as when the entire brain body is in resonance with the zero point field and it provides a sense of ecstasy, a sense of connectedness, a sense of uh, of this ineffable experience that you're trying to describe and which I try to describe uh, equally and effectively. Uh, <clears throat> but there is apparently now a physical explanation for this and we must ask ourselves, why did nature provide these feelings at all? And of course I go into that one in the book too. All right. Thank you, man. Uh, let's let's go into this one. Let's see if you can handle this one. Uh, have you done any thinking about the the nature of the soul? Somebody asked you about life after death. In other words, are we more than the sum total of our biological <clears throat> parts? Yeah. That's where this information comes from. A way of looking at it. This is a metaphor. This is a way to look at it. Is that the sum total of our experiences can be called information. Everything before now is just the information about what we've experienced. In other words, uh, your life is information that you remember. In other words, everything in your mind right now is just a memory from the past. Sure. So if we say that that memory, that information is coherent, that there is a way that it is preserved, that is about as good a scientific description of the soul as one can come up with. And we now have a mechanism for how that is preserved and carried forward. That's what I'm working on at the moment. And uh, it's a testable hypothesis. Uh, science is going to be able to deal with this uh, very, very short. You believe that we will begin to get a grasp on it, actually? I think we're doing so right now. I'm working with a number of scientists in Europe and here in the United States, including my good friend Hal Putoff that I worked with for years. Uh, and we're all batting these ideas back and forth. And it goes to the nature of holography. In other words, one of the things in physics that we're all familiar with now is a hologram or a holograph. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> Two-dimensional and three-dimensional. And it turns out that the brain constructs its images uh, much in the same way holograms are constructed. And it also turns out this may be nature's way of creating its coherence, its resonance, this interconnectedness we're talking about. Now, we're getting a little heavy for a uh, early morning show, but uh, that's probably going to be my next book as we try to explain this in lay terms. Fascinating. Um well, okay, we are the sum total of our experiences and maybe more. We're now entering an age where all kinds of memory and computer tricks are possible and storage and speed are increasing of CPUs. Will the day not come when information may be exchanged between biological entities and machines? Uh, or, or at least, uh, I guess what we call machines now, may become part biological themselves. Well, I kind of question that, because, uh, and this, this is a central point, so you can't be too adamant about it, but it's the fact that the inner experience of a silicon chip is probably quite different than the inner experience of a carbon-based brain. Mm -hmm. So it's not likely that uh, we will have androids that are very good humans. It is because of this subtle difference in non-locality or inner experience which goes to our intuition our ESP etc etc all of which we humans experience because of the particular nature of our carbon-based mind brain spirit if you will which is somewhat different than a silicon uh, silicon uh, entity it is but there are people who talk of biologically based or hybrid uh uh, computers of the future. It quite it is possible that we can do that. That uh, certainly sophisticated uh, computer technology, but there will be certain differences, and I, it's obviously much too early to tell how far we can go with that. It a lot of it, I guess, depends on the nature of awareness. Um, what what awareness? Keyword. You, yeah. you just hit the keyword, Art. Uh, yeah. Awareness, and this is what I describe in my book that awareness is a fundamental attribute of nature, of the matter in nature. That if you start to examine awareness closely, uh, as we, we in science 
used to think that it is a product of our evolved energetic uh, molecules. It turns out you just can't get there from here. That awareness has to be indigenous to nature itself. Hmm. Now, our mentality, our ability to think, to reason, to reflect, to be self-aware, yeah, that's probably uh, due to our evolutionary path. But awareness itself probably is not. At least that's the thesis I put forth. Fascinating. So you, you, you think we, in all probability, will not actually get to uh, awareness. And if we do, then we're, we're getting toward the core of it all. And I, I have to wonder that, if we should even be there. Well, I don't know whether we shouldn't be there. I think we have to understand it. But I believe that understanding awareness and volition, awareness and volition go together in my model. They are right at the core of the question. When we understand awareness and volition, we're probably right at the central, crucial issue. Fascinating. Uh, doctor, I have held you now for two hours. I have one hour of the program left. And uh, <laughs> if you are up to it, I would hold you. Or if you wish to rush off to breakfast, I know it's about 6 o'clock in the morning there. Well, let me get a refinish my teacup, and I'll stay with you a little bit if you like, because I'm enjoying talking with her. Absolutely folks. excellent. All right. Um, please go right ahead and do that. In the meantime... I'll begin to tell everybody how to get your book once again, all right? Very good. So go get some tea, and we'll hold you another hour. My guest is uh, Apollo 14 astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell. This is a priceless opportunity, and uh, we will lay more heavily on the phones in this final hour. He has written a book. It's called The Way of the Explorer. That's a good title, isn't it? The Way of the Explorer. Or otherwise, to go where no man has gone before. Hmm. Anyway, if you would like an autographed copy of his book, it really is a rare opportunity, an autographed copy of his book, dedicated, uh, to, I guess, supply the, uh, the verbiage you would like. He's willing to do that. He's going to be signing a lot of books. To get it, you uh, send $35 to Post Office Box... Six seven two eight sixty seven twenty eight Lake Worth. That's two words. Lake, as in that which holds all that water, and Worth, as in Fort Worth, Texas, but not Texas. So Lake Worth, Florida. Zip code three three four six one. Let me get that to you again. I know a lot of you uh, are rushing for pens. This will be a priceless opportunity, and probably a one one. One time chance to get an autographed copy like this, The Way of the Explorer. It is $35. It will be less in the stores, but of course you will not have a personally autographed version, and that's something to have as a keepsake. Post Office Box 6728, Lake Worth, Florida, 33461. And uh, I would like to thank you all for uh, participating. If you would like to either speak with uh, Dr. Mitchell or you're welcome to send a fax with a question. Let me give you my fax number. Here in Nevada, it is area code 702-727-8499. Now, I ask that you hold it to three pages, please. No more than that. I prefer one page if you can do that. Uh, a faxed question at area code 702 727 Eight four nine nine, and so there you have it. Uh, an evening with somebody who's been to the moon. It's always been a dream of mine to be able to ask these kinds of questions to somebody who's done something that I, uh, Dr. Mitchell said I may, but I suspect I may not ever get to the moon. In fact, that is a good question, I suppose, when we come back here in a moment, to ask whether any of us may have an opportunity to go. You never know. I, I never thought that I would uh, get to fly at Mach 2 Plus, but uh, I did. I got to go to Paris in the Concorde, so who knows. Maybe an opportunity will present itself, and I will get to go to the moon yet. Just that I'm not betting on it. So when we've got somebody here who's actually been, it is indeed a priceless opportunity. More of it coming up in a moment from the high desert. You're listening to the American CBC Radio Network. I'm Art Bell. Don't move.
Bell, toll free. West of the Rockies at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies at 1-800-825-5033. 1-800-825-5033. This is the CBC Radio Network. It is indeed. By the way, if you'd like to get a copy of this morning's program with Apollo 14 astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell, you can do so by calling 1-800-917-4278. That's 1-800-917-4278. We eat food every day, don't we? A lot of us assume, bad move, that we get all the benefits of that food, and we normally should. Now look, in your digestive tract, there is a bacteria, good, not bad. It is the actual process that drives the nutrition into your body and eliminates wastes. I don't have to go in great detail about that. You understand what I mean. If this bacteria um, becomes ill or dies, you have a problem. That process either reverses or halts. And a lot can kill that bacteria. Antibiotics, bad diet, alcohol, drugs, stress, even basic aging. And here's what restores it. Megadophilus, Bifidofactor, and Digestolact. Did you get all that? Of course not. It's Natrin's Healthy Trinity. And you can get it by calling 1-800-992-3323. 1-800-992-3323. Natrin's Healthy Trinity. I take it. So should you. The other word is about absolutely fresh flowers. Mother's Day is on the way. This is one you don't want to forget. Mothers don't like it when you forget. Believe me. So, don't. And uh, the way not to is to act now. Before Mother's Day. This is a flower farm. All they do is sell miniature carnations. They include a little card from you with your message, personalized, handwritten, and name at the bottom. And they're delivered by FedEx. And if you call now, they're delivered just before Mother's Day weekend at forty-two ninety-five. If you wait, it costs more. So, act now. Don't wait. I'm sure you've got a mother. Don't you? Send her flowers for Mother's Day. Uh, from Absolutely Fresh Flowers, the number is 1-800-562-6438. That's 1-800-562-6438. All right, now back to Dr. Edgar Mitchell. And, uh, Doctor, I presume you've got some tea in hand. Yes, I uh, have my herbal tea and I'm ready to go. All right. Um, we have done a number of programs on... Uh, something called HARP. I, I'm sure, I bet you're familiar with HARP. It's up in Alaska, and it is ostensibly a project to heat the ionosphere. Uh, in effect, boring a hole through the ionosphere uh, in order to study radio or improve radio propagation ostensibly, or to look for caverns or bunkers uh, beneath the earth. In other words, to geographically map what's below the surface of the earth. Uh, there are a lot of people concerned about harp. Dr. Nick Begich in Alaska wrote a book called Angels Don't Play This Harp. Do you know anything about the uh, angelic nature or lack of it of harp? I'm sure I, if you sprung a new one on me, that one I'm not familiar with. Uh-huh. Well, okay, that's worth looking into, believe me. They're going to uh, be pouring billions of watts in a, with a very directional uh, uh, antenna. Uh, toward the ionosphere, and it's an interesting project, and you, you don't know anything about it. No, but I can say if it's billions of watts, uh, that's an awful lot of energy, and uh, it should be looked at very carefully. Mm -hmm. That would be my reaction. If energy, energy in those amounts uh, needs to be studied carefully before you do it. Very good. Uh, on the first time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Good evening. Morning, actually. Hello. Hi. Hi to both of you. Uh, uh, it's a great honor to uh, speak to you, uh, yeah. Dr. Mitchell, and I Thank had you. a question. Uh, what was the most unexpected event that occurred during the Apollo 14 mission? Huh. Uh, <clears throat> well, two, two things. Uh, on the lunar surface, it was the difficulty of our uh, navigation uh, on a presumably relatively flat surface, finding out it wasn't so flat after all. Um, and in general, it was this perception of Earth from space, which uh, was overwhelming to many of us, of uh, seeing this awesome planet we call Earth uh -huh. and getting this new perspective that we're talking about, the epiphany, the insight, the 
wow, the aha. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that to me was the unexpected, uh, overwhelming. Did it seem surrealistic to you? Like, am I really here? Mm. Not quite surrealistic uh, so much as isn't it amazing that we react in this way? Isn't it amazing that here we knew, we know, the Earth is this little ball. It looks like a globe. It's moving around a rather average sun in a rather average galaxy way out on the spiral arm. We knew all of that intellectually. But when you experience it viscerally, mm -hmm. something different takes place. I'll bet it does. And that is precisely what got me on this whole path of uh, that I've been on for the last 25 years. What is it that's taking place? Why is it that we experience this? All right, where are, where are you calling from, sir? Uh, Alamo, California. All right, excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Mitchell, how much can you see now w with, with the kind of mission you were on? Um, how much detail when you're in orbit can you see uh, on the Earth? You said you saw the forest burning. Well, no, uh, you can see that. It depends on how far out you are, of course. Uh, if you are at the distance of the moon, well, you can see the the, uh, uh, you, the uh, continents, provided they're not obscured by cloud cloud cover. Mm -hmm. You can see uh, the deserts, the reddish color of the deserts, the green of the great jungles, and so forth, the blue of the water. Uh, detail is a little more difficult to perceive, but if you get in closer, of course, then you can see magnificent detail from a hundred miles up. And with our modern uh, surveillance devices, you can read license plates from space, as you probably know. Yes, I do. Uh, the whole series, the CAGE series of satellites, uh, I do believe they can look down and read license numbers. Mm -hmm. It's a little unnerving. All right, um, Wild Card Line. You're on the air with Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, uh, Dr. Mitchell. Good morning. Good morning, Mark. Where are you, sir? I'm in Eugene, Oregon. Okay. Yeah, uh, name's Andy, and I just, uh, I wanted to know uh, how the doctor felt about, uh, or if he was familiar with Dr. Robert Monroe's work. Uh, I knew Bob, Bob very well when he was alive, yeah. Oh, really? Really? Uh, astounding books, uh, uh, Out of Body Experience and mm -hmm. Far Journey, and I just wanted to get your feelings on, <clears throat> on his discoveries, on his uh, out of body, you know, his interdimensional travels, and, and uh, well. The way I explain it in my book, and I, d I go into this also, that you tie it together with the remote viewing experiences, mm -hmm. and it's merely a matter of detail and specificity, and again, the inner experience. From the detail of Bob and Rose work, the so-called out-of-body or astral projection, gives the experience of being there, but we can't find anything that goes anywhere. What you're doing is bringing, appar apparently, bringing the information here. In other words, information is everywhere, and you're simply focusing it from a point of view. So <clears throat> nothing has to go anywhere in order to perceive that information. A another way of looking at it is that we're here and everywhere simultaneously. Now, that's a tough one to get around. Yes, it is. But that seems to be the best description in that uh, it, is, it is simply a transformation of the viewpoint of information that exists and information apparently exists everywhere simultaneously. I had the honor of interviewing Dr. Monroe before he died. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found his um, information to be absolutely captivating. Are you, do you believe that I or that, any, or that a human being sufficiently trained um, and disciplined could take roughly the same trip you yes. took without uh, all the expense. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> you yep. do. Yep. 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 But part of the work we did in the laboratory uh, was with several psychics. Ingo Swan, a very noted one, uh, <clears throat> was able to do this and to bring back information from some of the larger and outer planets that was only verified later by NASA flyby. <laughs> so some of the work in remote viewing precisely gathers that sort of uh, information. Now, it turns out that uh, the detail can be quite good 
it can also be misleading sometimes because we do filter that through our own brain body, yes. our own information mechanism. Yes. But with good training and putting aside biases, quite often the information is startlingly accurate. Huh, fascinating. Uh, moon rocks. Everybody would like to ask about moon rocks, and I've got a bunch of faxes here. You brought back, and the Apollo series brought back many, many, many rocks. Mm -hmm. Did we find anything in those moon rocks that surprised or shocked us in any way, or did we just find rocks? Well, we found rocks, and we found that they are, uh, of course, the same minerals that we find on Earth, because the periodic table of elements is the same everywhere in the universe. But the combinations and the processes that form the rocks are clearly quite different, which is what we set out to discover. What are the processes on the moon that are different than the processes on Earth? And by and large, they're described by the, the lack of the lighter elements like oxygen, uh, hydrogen, all of which boiled off very early in the, the lunar process because of the reduced gravity, the smaller size. Sure. And they were present here on Earth. But what they did was give us clues as to how the uh, moon was formed, which in turn gives us clues as to how our own Earth came about. What is the best theory about how the moon was formed? Was it from Earth? There are people who feel it was early on from Earth. I will, I will, I'm going to have to beg off a little bit. I haven't read the most recent literature, <clears throat> but... They were formed at about the same time, early in the process, uh, and apparently uh, from the same giant mix, And but were, uh, I'm, I'm maybe a little tentative here, I, I believe that they have had a long, long history of separate as being independent entities, but they have been, uh, uh, may have been in conjunction at one time. There's one theory, and I'm a little confused here because I haven't studied it in quite a number of years. There was one theory that uh, the great part of the Pacific Ocean is a place where, like Siamese twins, they were separated at one point. Indeed. I'm not sure whether that theory is held up or not, but um, uh, and I'll have to beg off it without reading the, the more, most recent literature. All right. Uh, dear Art, please ask Dr. Mitchell about crop circles. What's his opinion? That's something I know you know, Linda Howe. As uh, a matter of fact, I think she interviewed you for this coming Dreamland this Sunday. Um, what do you think about these crop circles? They are odd. Uh, any theories? Well, they are odd, and I'm not enough of an expert uh, on those, nor have I studied them personally to be able to offer anything that's very valid. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And certain of them certainly have already been uh, described or admittedly created by hoax. That doesn't mean they all have. And I, I guess I have to remain open-minded on it and say I don't know the answer. Let's uh, get some more data here. All right. Uh, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Where are you, please? Uh, yes, hello, northern Florida. Uh, well, college student there. <laughs> yes, sir. Got a late, late of hours there. Indeed. Um, glad the uh, affiliates hanging on there. Bless them. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, you, uh, in, in the course of the, uh, uh, the interview there, uh, uh, well, the, the, the zero point, well, Mr. Hoagland referred to it as the hyperdimensional physics, etc. is that, um, uh, I have, well, uh, knowing a member of the space program for many years now, um, not going into great detail, is that, um, the spiritual, to be quite honest here, if you gentlemen would like to expound, uh, especially yourself, Dr. Mitchell, uh, Mr. Bell, you're quite up there as well, is that uh, what I have been uh, somewhat educated to is the spiritual, the truly the spiritual uh, endeavor is something that we are truly uh, expounding upon here, and the scientific is truly... Uh, just say just a well a tad of a notch below that in a way so to speak I'm not sure that I fully understand the nature of that question but I think he's saying do you hold the spiritual um, above the, the scientific uh, in terms of eventual answers no as a matter of fact the thesis here is that we're in a natural universe and that by and large it is explainable and knowable and that if it is not, that will show up too. Uh, but so 
so far, it seems to be explainable and knowable. And certainly what we call the spiritual is an intimate, personal part of our existence. Mm -hmm. But I don't find it uh, never-never land, supernatural, uh, mm -hmm. uh, anything any more uh, hierarchically above or below. I don't use those terms, above, below, and in a hierarchical sense. It just is. And it's a part of the universe that we experience. And our uh, our hope is to understand it better. You seem to be uh, very much in sympathy with those who suggest that if the space program is moving slower right now, that's no big deal, let's get it together here and then worry about space later. Is that about right? Yeah. We're, we've got lots of time. We've got about five billion years, but as long as this sun is still burning out there. Uh, which is about its lifetime. And right now we've got some major problems here on Earth. We will eventually go on back to, Earth, back to the moon. We will go on to Mars. We will go on. Our destiny, I believe, is to explore this universe. And we'll do that in due course. Right now we better get our act together. How worried was NASA that you might bring i know there was a period of isolation when you came back were they concerned that you might bring back a little bug or a virus or a something on, that you would step on and yep. cling to you on the moon how long were you isolated when you came back well we had three three weeks and we were the last flight to be post-flight quarantined we were also the first flight to be pre-flight quarantined so no. we had a double dose of it both before and after we were uh, why the pre-flight was that to avoid well that was because on apollo 13 ken mattingly was exposed to Charlie Duke's measles, sorry, his son's measles. Oh, that's right. And uh, got bumped from the flight because of it, which, as it turned out, uh, Ken helped get them back. So, as Jim Lovell says, there were blessings come in disguises. Mm. But um, yeah, we were we were pre-flight quarantined to prevent disease from getting into space, and we were post-flight quarantined to keep space disease from getting here. It turns out there wasn't any. Obviously, since you were slated for 14... Uh, when the problems occurred to 13, I'm sure it had your attention. Mm -hmm. uh, doctor, how close was it? Well, it was darn close. See, Apollo 13 was originally my flight. Um, when Alan Shepard came on the crew, we were slated to replace uh, Gordon Cooper. Mm -hmm. uh, we were slated to do the Apollo 13 flight. And mm -hmm. NASA headquarters uh, suggested that since Alan had not been in training for some time, he ought to take a little more time to train and negotiated a crew switch with Jim Lovell's crew, which was then Apollo 14. So they, we switched crews and uh, switched missions. They got the bad bird and we got the good one. And that was kind of the break of the draw. Still, you must have. What were you doing uh, when 13 well, I was, was on the Well, I was doing exactly, back? if you saw Apollo 13, I was doing exactly in the lunar module what Ken Mattingly was doing in the command module, uh, learning how to fly that beast uh, as a lifeboat, low power, no power, manually. Uh, it's kind of like uh, learning to take uh, your, your sailboat on the open seas, or let's say your dinghy on the open seas, and turn it into a lifeboat to bring the major craft home. Was it as frantic as depicted in Apollo 13? Well, I'm not sure frantic is the right word. It was high pressure, intense, and very, very methodical. <laughs> As we tested everything we knew how to test, we used creativity to the ultimate extent because that particular failure, we practiced that failure, and when they gave it to us, we said, hey, guys, you just killed us. We don't need to practice getting killed. So we never really practiced it, but we knew such a such a thing could happen. Uh, but when it really happened, then we had to go to work and figure out what to do about it. So and We were just hours ahead of death all the time. Uh, these guys could have expired uh, any time in the next two or three hours. We were solving problems that were just just uh, uh, ward, warding off the ultimate uh, destiny by hours. If Apollo 13 had ended in disaster instead of a miracle, virtually, <laughs> Uh, would 14 have flown? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know that it would have totally killed the program at that point, but it would certainly have been a major setback. Had we on Apollo 14 also messed up and not had a good mission, I think that would have definitely killed the program. 
Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Hi. Um, this is Colleen from Farmington, New Mexico. Hi there. And I have two questions for Dr. Mitchell. The first one being, uh, whose records would you suggest to look into the Roswell crash? The Army, Air Force, or Navy? The, uh, the what, please? The Army, Air, Air Force, or Navy. <laughs> I don't know that those records are um, are in either of those repositories anymore. Uh, people have been trying to do this for years, and it's in the literature. They've tried the Freedom of Information Act to get it to get back uh, uh, documents that are blacked out uh, mostly. So <clears throat> I don't know that that is the right approach. It's, you use the Freedom of Information Act and go after the information. And we're really not going to get any more information until there's a general amnesty or release of classification on these particular documents. Well, as you know, uh, Doctor, ma'am, hold on a sec. Uh, they, they really did come out with fairly recent information saying, well, we lied, it really wasn't a balloon. Uh, the true story is, it was a different kind of balloon. Yeah. Right. That's, <laughs> so, that's, that's, that's the new story. Yeah, yeah. the new story. Yeah. All right, ma'am, uh, you have another question? Yes, I do. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, do you have any knowledge of a crash at Aztec? Of what? A crash at Aztec. I'm sorry, I do not. I think I've heard of that incident, but I have no personal knowledge at all. Okay, thank you very much. All right, but again, you on balance uh, are of the personal opinion that Roswell, that something did happen, something did crash at Roswell. <clears throat> well, I, don't know. I think there's no doubt that something did crash. Uh, Art, I have to say, I am not an expert in any of these particular. I have followed other people or professional investigators. I have looked at the overall evidence. I have listened to testimony from very high place to people with first-hand experience whom I find quite credible. But I do not consider myself an expert in this area at all. All right, Doctor, hold on. Um, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, Apollo 14 astronaut, back in a moment. You're listening to the American CBC Radio Network. Taking calls on the wild card line at 702-727-1295. That's 702-727-1295. First time callers can reach Art Bell at 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222. Now, here again, Art Bell. Once again, here I am. Very rare opportunity, three hour opportunity at that to speak to somebody who's been where we haven't. The Moon, he's Apollo uh, 14 astronaut uh, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, and he'll be back in just a moment. I have a little catching up to do here. Uh, the Sea Crane Company sells the best shortwave radio for the money, period. C818CS. It uh, covers everything from 150 kilohertz to 30 megahertz, all of the shortwave band. The AM band with wide, narrow filtering. If you are uh, tired of fading on AM, this won't stop it, but it'll cut it down. If you want to enter the wonderful world of shortwave, this will get you there from here. It's uh, got every conceivable feature that you can imagine uh, built in, including a cassette deck so you can record whatever you hear with timers, 45 one-touch memories, AM filtering that is mwah, superb, an RF gain control, beat frequency oscillator, things that right now you'll probably, your little eyes will glaze over as you hear about, but that you will certainly need when you get this uh, get this irresistible urge to hear what's out there. The A18CS will get you there. It's two twenty four ninety five delivered to your door. If you want to spend less, around one seventy nine ninety five, you can go for the eight one eight. It is the same exact radio minus the cassette deck. Both of them available from the Sea Crane Company at 9 o'clock this morning or 7.30 Monday morning, and the number to call is 
800-800-8863. I've been in shortwave many years, and I can tell you, uh, it's more than a radio. It's the beginning of a hobby and an eye-opener. 1-800-522-8863. I don't have to tell you what's happening to telecommunications. It's incredible. It's not just a technical revolution. There's an explosion of opportunity going on, business opportunity. Microtech is one of the premier communications companies that's had the strength and foresight to grab a big chunk of the hot new SMR market. Specialized mobile radio. Remember SMR because you're going to be hearing a lot more about it in the future. When it comes to Microtech, the future is now. They've already completed SMR stations in major markets like New York, Los Angeles, Dallas, and Boston. They're ready to build more. While license opportunities last, that's where you come in. If you're willing to make one free phone call, you can discover how a minimum $8,700 participation in the explosive telecommunications industry could return to you twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 or more, plus a yearly income for the rest of your life, and it can be part of your IRA or retirement plan. Of course, you've got to meet some investor qualifications, but if you do, they'll send a free video and all the information you're going to need to make the right decision. Call toll-free 1-800-444-1049. Ensure your financial future. Call 1-800-444-1049. That's 1-800-444-1049. If you've got hard water, you've got a hard problem. You've suffered long enough now, haven't you? It puts white spots on your car when you wash it. It builds in your pipes and your water heater and costs you a lot of money and possibly a big plumbing bill one day. GMX Water Conditioning Systems protect all of that and more. It'll cut your cleaning chores in half. With GMX, you don't use salt, electricity, you never waste any water, and you never have to pay any maintenance costs. A single $600 expense takes care of it for the rest of your life. It's been working in my home now for two years. I know. It'll work for you in 90 days or they buy it back. You get your money back. Look, in a whole year, we've never had a single customer complaint. So, order today. Call GMX and get it on the way. The number is 1-800-4060-GMX. Again, 1-800-4060-GMX. Well, okay, I'm going to plug the doctor's book for him again if you would uh, if you'd like an actual uh, the book is the way of the explorer good title huh if you'd like a signed dedicated copy this is your one big shot to get it it's thirty five dollars and the way you get it is supply the name you would like it dedicated to send off your thirty five dollars check or money money order I don't recommend cash you shouldn't really should not ever send cash in the mail to post office box six seven two eight that's sixty seven twenty eight lake worth two words l a k e w o r t h lake worth florida three three four six one zip code one more time Post Office Box 6728, Lake Worth, Florida, zip code 33461. Now, back to Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Doctor? Hello there. Hi. Um, doctor, uh, my one, a little earlier we talked about whether I would ever have a chance to fly uh, as you flew or in any other way. I, I had one great experience, Doctor, and that was I flew in the Concorde. Uh, from this country to Paris at, machine, at, oh man at Mach 2 plus and they let me go up into the cockpit at Mach 2 and it was all very exciting and I remember putting my hand on the window when we were doing about Mach 2 and this thing was roaring along and the window was so hot you couldn't hold your hand on it that's a problem uh-huh and problem. and and you flew at Mach <laughs> I think I forgot how to convert it but it's uh, just figure for a minute Mach many uh, not many. 36,600 feet per second. Oh, brother. <laughs> uh, what kind of temperatures uh, during reentry are reached? Mm, there's, um, well, it's enough to ablate and melt the, the heat shield. It comes up to several thousand, but I don't remember the exact number. Several thousand? Several. Um, does I've got a piece of it right here on my desk. It's a very charred uh, core from the heat shield that uh, burns that phenol. So without that heat shield, it's crispy critters. Well, what is designed to melt away and carry the heat away, that's, that's the way it's designed, is to ablate or melt. And big globs of it 
burn off and go streaking by the window on the way back. <laughs> that must be weird. Yeah. Uh, to realize that uh, minus that, <laughs> that, that would be you burning off and going by the windshield. Yeah, it, we, fortunately, we have a pretty good uh, uh, thermal control system, but it does start to warm up and it has to work. Oh, I was going to ask that. Did it, uh, in other words, it doesn't remain a constant pretty 70 degrees inside? No, it starts to warm up a little mm -hmm. bit. Uh, but the thermal controls then take over and keep you reasonably comfortable. All right. Back to the phones we go. First time caller line. You're on the air with Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Hi. Hi, I'm calling from Garden Grove. Good morning. Garden Grove, California? California. All right. Yeah. Dr. Mitchell, mm -hmm. we're all pretty familiar with um, Neil Armstrong's first words when he stepped onto the moon. Mm -hmm. What were yours? <laughs> Well, my first thought was, what am I doing here? <laughs> but it, it's an awesome experience. It's absolutely wonderful. If you're an explorer, and that's the way I consider myself. Do you remember uh, what you said, though? Your actual I, first I, No, I don't remember what I said. Uh, it was probably more, we can go back on the record and check it out. Oh, okay. I've got the transcript right here. I just don't happen to remember exactly. <laughs> it was, it was, it was uh, more technical. It was more, let's get on with it. Uh-huh. How about that, the first night you slept? Uh, what was your dream? Did you dream while you were on the moon? Oh, no, it was pretty fitful sleeping. Uh, it was what? I don't, it was fitful sleeping <clears throat> because we were anxious. Uh, we were tilted a little bit. We landed on a slope. <clears throat> and we had the feeling that we were tipping over. Now, we knew we weren't, but the bodily feeling, the sensation, was one of tipping over. So we caught ourselves wanting to peek out the window every once in a while to make sure we weren't. Uh, and of course we weren't because we knew that. But it was a very strange feeling. It was not not a good night's sleep at all. When you leave uh, the Earth, Doctor, and you you leave the Earth's gravitational uh, effect, and you're suddenly weightless, can you explain to people who have probably always wondered what that feels like? The best the best uh, simulation of it is underwater. If you're a scuba diver, uh, go underwater, ballast, weightless. Uh, close your eyes so you don't see which way the bubbles go, mm -hmm. and remain motionless. That's the way it feels. <laughs> or if you happen to be a pilot, you can uh, go up and do a ballistic trajectory and uh, kind of float like a rock floating through the, the sky, and you'll get the same feeling. I've heard it described as one falling, too. Falling? Well, that's what, yeah, that's what happens. Did you, did you have nausea, any illness, or did you just take to it like a fish to water? Well, we conditioned uh, because some folks had had inner ear vertigo, disorientation. We went up and practiced in our T-38 trainers uh, doing all sorts of aerobatic maneuvers to push ourselves right to the verge of sickness and vertigo and train the inner ear and so that we could control it. Boy. Um, did you enter all this with any trepidation or great thought about it before you did it or was it just plunge ahead hell yes I want to do this well my my uh, goal had been set for since 1957 as I explained earlier and I think most of our class we were there were 19 of us selected in 1966 uh, most of our class had the feeling you mean we get paid for doing this it's <laughs> wonderful uh, yes, I know that feeling. We were really eager to, to go do the job. Um, yes, but at that moment, when you were all up in that uh, 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 capsule, up on top of that great big potential bomb, there must have been a moment just before launch when you all looked at each other, busy as you must have been, you sort of looked at each other and said, okay, guys, here we go, knock on wood. Well, Stu Rusa, now deceased, or good friend and command module pilot, used to call those moments sweaty palms time. Yeah, that's right. And every time we would ignite the engines, he'd say, okay, gentlemen, it's sweaty palms time again. Uh, because there's always that moment of apprehension. Is it going to work? Uh, this equipment had never been tested in space, as you know. It was yes. throwaway equipment. Once you use it, you, it's done. Mm -hmm. And so each piece of equipment is brand new. And you always have that concern when you start it off. Is it going to work? Um, wild card line, you're on the air with Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Hi. Yes, good morning, Edgar. I'm a retired Air Force officer who had the occasion about 20 years ago to invite um, Buzz Aldrin up to Dallas Air Force Base for an award ceremony. 
and hosted him for a couple of days, so I consequently got to talk to him at length. Mm-hmm. And while he was open to talking about the problems and conditions... Sir, there's something wrong you're with your... breaking up here. You're, yeah, there's something wrong with your phone. He was, he was um, reluctant to talk about his um, experiences and sightings of the UFOs. Was, was at that time, and is there still a um, precondition to talking about those kind of encounters, sites, well, we didn't have any of those encounters, as far as I know, including Buzz, but um, uh, there may be things I don't know, but I don't believe so. Did Buzz Aldrin Did Buzz Aldrin tell you he saw UFOs? Yes, he did. He said there were, uh, most of the astronauts had had some experiences with um, discs, um, lights. Um, I'm sorry, that is simply not true. That's just not true. Well, I don't know where his, you're getting your information, but I'm sorry. How about his it. experiences in specific? And well, if, if he's not aware of uh, Mr. Aldrin's experiences, uh, he can't comment on them. And as far as his are concerned, he said he had none, right? Right. So there you are. Uh, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Good morning. Where are you, please? Yeah. Are you talking to me, Art? Uh, it's you I'm talking to, yes. Yeah, all right. Good morning. I'm a long-time listener, and it's the first time I ever called you. Where are you? I'm in uh, Galveston County, not too far from NASA down here. Oh, yeah. okay. I didn't know till the night that, that you and I walked on the same ground. I was a, a Air Force medic at Lackland Air Force Base for four years. Well, all they did to me at Lackland was give me eight weeks of hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm also a ham radio operator. Well, all right, then we have 75 meters. There you are. We've got a lot in common then. Yeah, let, let me. Uh, uh, I've got something to talk about to, to the doctor there. Where boy, he hit some. This is a really uh, interesting night, Art, and uh, you're killing me. You're keeping me awake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I found out early in my teens that I was a psychic healer of sorts, and uh, as I grew older, it, uh, it, uh, I discovered a lot more about it, and I did a lot of it, and uh, it, I never would charge anything for it, and it got to where it was aggravating. People would call me in the middle of the night and uh, to go take care of back pains and neck chronic problems I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. And it kind of created some problems at home. So about 10 or 12 years ago, I just started just kind of just dropping away and and not, uh, uh, you know, more or less kind of going into denial with this thing. And uh, I'm very careful about who I do it with now and to, uh, who I uh, I I, uh, I take care of their problems. But uh, I've been in 95% of the time I'm 100% effective, and and about 5% of the time I'm about 95% effective. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, my big question is, I, I don't know where this comes from, and I never would charge anything for the uh, uh, for the gift, I guess you'd call it. Uh, I don't know where. I, my grandmother now was uh, 100% Cherokee Indian, and my aunt was too, and they, they had uh, all sorts of things, clairvoyance and everything else. All right, well, let's ask where it does come from. Doctor, uh, it, you it, related the experience with your mother. Yeah, it's the way we're built. We all have that capability. Now, not everyone is able to exercise it as effectively as this gentleman uh, can. It probably has a genetic component that allows us to manifest it, but it's really more the neuro, neural connections in the brain. We're, we're now very convinced, uh, and as a matter of fact, this is part of what we're trying to make some visuals uh, with uh, the North Tower Film Group on, on these areas. Uh, we're now quite convinced that we can train people to do all of these things, particularly if we begin prenatally. Uh, hmm. the, brain, the brain is like any muscle in the sense that its capabilities, you either use them or lose them. And it's amazing the number of capabilities that we have as very, very young children that because we don't exercise them or they are negated by doubting parents, uh, those neurological connections then are pruned off. Uh, nature does that. You either use them or lose them. But it turns out you can get them back, some of them, with arduous work uh, much later in life. So it's, it, they're not lost forever. But we all seem to have these rather amazing capabilities. I call them creative capabilities. It goes to the whole area of healing, psychokinetic stuff, the things that Uri Geller does, the, the healers that I worked with, the gentleman that's our caller, uh, everybody has these capabilities latent. And I'm convinced that they're emerging. We will learn to use them better. They're a part of our right-left brain complex that uh, we can very quickly learn to use better if we put uh, an right. effort to it. Let's take the example of your mother mm-hmm. and the story you told us. Um, 
that healing, doctor, did that come to your mother from an external source, the healer, or did that come because your mother believed? Both. It, it's the interaction of the two. Uh, the healing comes from within us. The body knows how to heal itself. We have to get out of the way. And quite often someone else can help us get out of the way. So we got to get our mind out of the way. I think the actual energy itself is the, the basic energy comes from within the body and the repository, the source of that energy is the zero point field. I think that more than likely, and this is speculative stuff, that probably the people that use acupuncture, the ancient orientals that learned acupuncture, that the little acupuncture needles are probably uh, the mechanism for accessing the zero point field. So they're, they're an energetic uh, mechanism. That's fascinating. And it's both, it is both the healing comes from within ourselves, but an external healer helps us access it. All right. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Good morning. Good morning, Art. Where are you, sir? I am in Rawling, Wyoming. All right. This question I'd like to pose. It's kind of a multifaceted question. I, me and a friend of mine discussed something uh, about uh, actual artificial intelligence. I'd like to know if uh, the government or he or a group of his, uh, his uh, comrades have been working on anything like this, artificial intelligence and form like a cyborg or a robot? Well, we were actually discussing that a little earlier. Uh, well, you know, very briefly on that, uh, artificial in intelligence is just managing information. And it's, we're being very, very successful at artificial ways or robotic ways or computerized ways to manage information. But uh, the real question is, what is the difference between the way the biological organism manages information and a computer chip? I maintain that there's always going to be a different, but uh, we're getting pretty sophisticated with our artificial mm. intelligence. We are, and it's uh, an interesting thing to wonder where the, where it's going. Yeah, we, and we don't have an answer to that. It's just going to go where we can take it. Uh, we're never really going to limit ourselves in terms of how far we go, are we? I mean, we're always going to have debates about whether we're getting in God's or the Creator's territory, but we're going there anyway, aren't we? I think that's true. The question is, what is the value system, the moral system, uh, that we evolve to guide our volition? And it's very clear that we do not have the proper guidance uh, for our current technologies. We are way ahead in our technological capability of our understanding of morality and ethics and so forth. That brings me to a very important point, whether it's uh, the HARP project that I touched on a little while ago, or it's scientists doing medical experimentation. Uh, uh, for example, and I, I certainly don't necessarily object to it, but there was an experiment in San Francisco in which they attempted to inject a, um, a baboon's immune system into a human being uh, who had AIDS and virtually uh, destroyed his immune system and tried to substitute a baboon's. And the scientists, after they announced it, doctor, said, well, yes, there is some danger to humankind that some uh, virus uh, that was from the baboon may be introduced to human beings in this way. Some danger, but they went ahead and did it and sort of told us about it afterwards. So we are getting ahead of things in a lot of cases. Scientists are into areas where, to me, it's a little worrisome. You feel that, too? Well, I feel it's very, very worrisome. I'm very concerned about uh, not understanding the implications of our decisions, uh, particularly... Uh, in genetic research, in this sort of biological research. Uh, uh, you know, these viruses are organisms, too, and they need to survive. <laughs> the, imp the survival impulse runs throughout nature, and nature is going to try to find a way, each level, to make itself survive. We have to be quite careful about what we're doing here. We have to invent, discover a new way of looking at morality and ethics and it derives from what is the nature of the universe that we're living in? Who are we really? And those questions need to matter. 
Um, do you think that the race between technology and our ability to control it morally or ethically is going to be lost, or are we going to catch up to it and uh, say to ourselves, now, wait a minute, let's think a little bit before we do this. I am the eternal optimist that uh, we, humankind, will come to our senses, recognize the problem, and deal with it. Do it. Will we have bits and starts and scare ourselves half to death and uh, <laughs> proceed along the course of the lemmings, uh, certainly for a while. Uh, it goes by fits and starts, it's not a smooth path. Doctor, but, we are we are utterly out of time, okay. um, and, and so we're going to have to end it here, but um, I would like to say someday I would sure like to have you back again. Well, maybe we can work that. All right. And it's been a pleasant being with you, Art. Thank you, and uh, Dr. Mitchell, uh, I'm going to give you the honors. The honors here are, just say good night, America. Good night, America. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Take care, Dr. Mitchell. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye now. All right, that's Dr. Edgar Mitchell and um, Apollo 14 astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Thank you all. It has been a glorious night, as always. Dreamland Sunday, back with the syndicated program. Uh, Monday night, Tuesday morning. Thank you all from the high desert. Good night, America.